Within the Gates, originally titled Intramuros, by Rebecca Springer, read by Christopher Glynn. I was many hundreds of miles away from home and friends and had been ill for many weeks. I was entirely among strangers, and my only attendant, though of a kindly disposition, knew nothing whatever about the duties of the sick room. Hence, I had none of the many delicate attentions that keep up an invalid's failing strength. I'd had no nourishment of any kind for nearly three weeks, scarcely even water, and was greatly reduced in both flesh and strength. I had an unutterable longing for the presence of my distant loved ones, but they never came. They could not. I lay in a large, comfortable room on the second floor of a house in Kentville. A large stained-glass window opened upon a veranda fronting on the street. During much of my illness I lay with my face to the window. When the longing for distant faces and voices came more than I could bear, I prayed that the dear Christ would help me to realize His blessed presence, and that since loved ones of the earth could not minister to me, I might feel his presence. Especially did I not ask to be sustained should I be called to pass through the dark waters alone. It was no idle prayer, and the response came swiftly and speedily. All anxieties and cares slipped away from me as a worn-out garment, and Christ's peace enfolded me. One morning, Dark and cold and stormy, after a day and night of intense suffering, I seemed to be standing on the floor by the bed in front of the stained glass window. Someone was standing by me, and when I looked up, I saw it was my husband's favorite brother who crossed the river many years ago. My dear brother Frank, I cried out joyously, how good of you to come. It was a great joy to me that I could do so, little sister, he said gently. Shall we go now? And he drew me toward the window. I turned my head and looked back into the room that somehow I felt I was about to leave forever. The attendant sat by the stove at the farther end, comfortably reading a newspaper, and on the bed turned toward the window lay a still white form with the shadow of a smile on the poor, worn face. My brother drew me gently, and I yielded, passing with him through the window, out onto the veranda, and from thence on down the street. There I paused and said earnestly, I cannot leave my husband Will and our dear son. They're not here, dear, but hundreds of miles away, he answered. Yes, I know, but they will be here. Oh, Frank, they will need me. Let me stay, I pleaded. Would it not be better if I brought you back a little later, after they come, he said with a kind smile. Would you certainly do so? And with his assurance, we started slowly up the street. But my heart clung to the dear ones whom I felt would not see me again on earth and several times I stopped and looked wistfully back the way we had come. He was very patient and gentle with me, waiting always until I was ready to proceed again. At length he said, You're so weak that I think I'd better carry you. And without waiting for a reply, he stooped and lifted me in his arms as though I had been a little child. And like a little child, I yielded, resting my head upon his shoulder and laying my arm about his neck. It seemed so sweet, after the long, lonely struggle, to have someone assume the responsibility of caring thus tenderly for me. He walked on with firm, swift steps. And I think I must have slept, for the next thing I knew, I was sitting in a sheltered nook made by flowering shrubs 
upon the softest and most beautiful turf in the world, thickly studded with fragrant flowers, many of them flowers I'd known and loved on earth. In the first moment, I observed how perfect in its way was every plant and flower. And what a scene that was on which I looked as I rested upon this fragrant cushion. Away, far beyond the limit of my vision, stretched this wonderful swirl of grass and flowers, and out of it grew equally wonderful trees, whose drooping branches were laden with exquisite blossoms and fruits of many kinds. I found myself thinking of St. John's vision on the Isle of Patmos and the tree of life that grew in the midst of the garden bearing twelve manner of fruits and whose leaves were for the healing of the nations. Beneath the trees, in many happy groups, were little children laughing and playing, running hither and thither in their joy. All through the grounds, older people were walking, sometimes in groups, sometimes by twos, sometimes alone, but all with an air of peacefulness and happiness that made itself felt to me even a stranger. All were in spotless white, though many wore about them or carried in their hands clusters of beautiful flowers. As I looked upon their happy faces and their spotless robes, again I thought, These are they which have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Everywhere I looked, I saw elegant and beautiful houses of a strangely attractive architecture, half hidden by the trees, that I felt must be the homes of the happy inhabitants of this enchanted place. I caught glimpses of sparkling fountains in many different directions, and close to my retreat flowed a river with placid surface and water as clear as crystal. The walks that ran in many directions through the grounds appeared to be of pearl, spotless and pure, bordered on either side by narrow strips of crystalline water running over stones of gold. The one thought that fastened itself upon me as I looked breathless and speechless upon this scene was purity, purity. No shadow of dust, no taint of decay of fruit or flower, everything perfect, everything pure. The grass and flowers looked as though fresh washed by summer showers, and not a single blade was any other color but the brightest green. The air was soft and balmy, though invigorating, and instead of sunlight, there was a golden glow and rosy glory everywhere something like the afterglow of a southern sunset in midsummer. Suddenly I looked up and heard my brother, who was standing beside me, say softly, Well? I discovered that he was watching me with keen enjoyment. I had in my great surprise and delight wholly forgotten his presence. I would have answered, but then such an overpowering sense of God's goodness and my own unworthiness swept over me that I dropped my face in my hands and burst into uncontrollable and very human weeping. My brother lifted me gently to my feet and said, Come, I want to show you the river. When we reached the brink of the river but a few steps distant, I found that the lovely meadow ran even to the water's edge and in some places I saw flowers blooming placidly down in the depths among the colored pebbles with which the entire bed of the river was lined. My brother, stepping into the water, urged me to do the same. I drew back timidly, saying, I fear it is cold. Not in the least, he said with a reassuring smile. Come. Just as I am, I said, glancing down at my lovely robe, which, to my great joy, I found was similar to those of the dwellers in that happy place. Just as you are, 
he said with a reassuring smile. Thus encouraged, I stepped into the gently flowing river. To my great surprise, I found the water, in both temperature and density, almost identical with the air. Deeper and deeper grew the stream as we passed on. It'll go over my head, I objected. I cannot breathe under the water. I'll suffocate. An amused twinkle came into his eyes, though he said, soberly enough, We do not do those things here. Realizing the absurdity of my position, I plunged headlong into the bright water, which soon rippled several feet above my head. To my surprise and delight, I found I could not only breathe, but laugh, talk, and hear as naturally under the water as above it. I sat down in the midst of the many-colored pebbles and filled my hands with them as a child would have done. My brother lay down upon them as he would have done on the green sward and laughed and talked joyously with me. Do this, he said, rubbing his hands over his face and running his fingers through his dark hair. I did as he told me, and the sensation was delightful. I threw back my loose sleeves and rubbed my arms, then my throat, and again thrust my fingers through my long, loose hair, thinking at the time what a tangle it would be in when I left the water. What marvellous water! What wonderful air! I said to my brother, as we again stepped upon the flowery sward. Are all rivers here like this one? Not just the same, but similar, he replied. Then the thought came, as we prepared to leave the water, what would we do for towels? For earth thoughts still clung to me, and I wondered, too, if my lovely robe was not spoiled. But behold, as we neared the shore, and my head once more emerged from the water, the moment the air struck my face and hair, I realized I would need no towel or brush. My flesh, my hair, my beautiful garments, were as soft and dry as they had been before the water touched them. The material out of which my robe was fashioned was unlike anything that I had ever seen. It was soft and light and shone with a faint luster, reminding me more of silk crepe than anything I could recall, only infinitely more beautiful. It fell about me in soft, graceful folds, which water seemed to have rendered even more lustrous than before. We walked on a few steps, and I turned and looked back at the shining river flowing on so tranquilly. Frank, what has the water done for me? I said. I feel as though I could fly. He looked at me with earnest, tender eyes as he answered gently, it has washed away the last of the earth life and fitted you for the new life into which you have entered. It is divine, I whispered. Yes, it is divine, he said. some distance in silence, my heart unbelieving with the thoughts of the strange new life. The houses, as we approached and passed them, seemed wondrously beautiful to me. They were built of the finest marbles, encircled by broad verandas, the roofs or domes supported by massive or delicate pillars or columns, and winding steps led down to the pearl and golden walk. Happy faces looked out from these columned walls, and happy voices rang upon the clear air from many a celestial home. Frank, where are we going? At length I asked. Home, little sister, he answered tenderly. Home? Have we a home, my brother? Is it anything like these? I asked with a wild desire in my heart to cry out for joy. Come and see, 
was his only answer as he turned into a side path leading towards an exquisitely beautiful house whose columns of very light grey marble shone through the green of the overhanging trees with the most inviting beauty. Before I could join him, I heard a well-remembered voice saying close beside me, I just had to be the first to bid you welcome. Looking around, I saw the dearly loved face of my old friend, Mrs. Wickham. Oh, oh, I cried as we met in warm embrace. You will forgive me, Colonel Springer, she said a moment later, giving her hand cordially to my brother. It seems almost unpardonable to intercept you thus in almost the first hour, but I heard that she was coming, and I could not wait. But now that I have looked upon her face and heard her dear voice, I will be patient till I can have her for a long, long talk. We have all eternity before us, but you will bring her to me soon, Colonel Springer? she asked. Just as soon as I may, dear madam, he replied with an expressive look into her eyes. Then with a warm hand clasp and the parting injunction, come very soon, she swiftly passed out of my sight. Her home is not very far away. You can see her often. She is a lovely woman. Now, come, little sister. I long to give you a welcome to our home. With that, he took my hand and led me up to the broad veranda with its beautiful inlaid floor of rare and costly marbles and its massive columns of grey, between which vines covered with rich, glossy leaves were intermingled with flowers of exquisite colour and delicate perfume hanging in heavy festoon. We paused a moment here, that I might see the charming view on every side. It is heavenly, I said. He answered that it could not be otherwise, and led me through a doorway between the marble columns into a large reception hall, whose inlaid floor and broad low stairway at the far end at once held my fancy. Before I could speak, my brother took my two hands and said, Welcome, a thousand welcomes, dearest sister, to your heavenly home. It is your home, and I am to stay with you, I said, a little confused. Oh, it's your home, and I am to stay with you until my brother comes. Always, dear brother, always, I cried, clinging to his arm. He smiled and said, We will enjoy the present. We will never be far apart again. But come, I am eager to show you all. Turning to the left, he led me through the beautiful marble columns that everywhere seemed substituted for doorways into a long, oblong room upon whose threshold I stopped in wondering delight. The entire walls of the room were again of that exquisite light grey marble polished to the greatest luster. But over the walls and floor were strewn exquisite long stem roses of every variety and colour, from the deepest crimson to the most delicate shades of pink and yellow. I stooped to touch them, and lo, they were embedded in the marble. My brother explained, One day, while the house was building, a company of young people came to the door and asked if they might enter. I gladly gave them my consent. Then they asked who the building was for, and when I told them, they asked, May we beautify this room? I gave them permission, wondering what they might do. The girls, who had immense bunches of roses in their hands, began to throw the flowers over the floor and against the walls. Whenever they struck the walls, to my surprise, they remained, as though in some way permanently attached. When all the roses had been scattered, the room looked just as it does now, only the roses were really freshly gathered roses. 
Then the boys each produced a small case of delicate tools, and in a moment all boys and girls were down on the marble floor and busy at work. How they did it, I do not know. It's one of the celestial arts, taught to those of highly artistic tastes. But they embedded each living flower just where it had fallen in the marble, and preserved it as you see before you. They came several times before the work was completed, for the flowers do not wither here nor fade, but are always fresh and perfect. And such a merry, happy company of young people I never saw before. They laughed and chatted and sang as they worked. I could not help wishing more than once that the friends whom they'd left in mourning for them might look upon this group and see how little cause for sorrow they had. At last, when all the work was completed, they called me to see their work, and I was not sparing of my praises either for the beauty of the work or for their skill in performing it. Then, saying they'd be sure to return when either of you came, they went their way together to do something of the kind elsewhere, I do not doubt. Happy tears began dripping upon my hands, and greatly touched I asked who these lovely people were. He replied that he knew them now, but they were strangers until they came that first morning, and he named them. They were children I had known in my earth days. Precious children, I said. How little I thought my love for them in the olden days would ever bring to me this added happiness here. How little we know of the links binding the two worlds. Ah, yes, said my brother, that is just it. How little we know. If only we could realize while we are yet mortals that day by day we're building for eternity, how different our lives in many ways would be. Every gentle word, every generous thought, every unselfish deed will become a pillar of eternal beauty in the life to come. We cannot be selfish and unloving in one life and generous and loving in the next. The two lives are too closely blended, one but a continuation of the other. But now, come to the library. Rising, we crossed the room that henceforth was to hold for me such tender associations, and entered the library. It was a glorious apartment, the walls lined from ceiling to floor with rare and costly books. The large stained-glass window opened upon the front veranda. The semicircular row of shelves, supported by very delicate pillars of grey marble about six feet high, extended some fifteen feet into the spacious main room and cut it into two sections lengthwise, each one with bowed windows in the back, leaving still a large space beyond the dividing line where the two sections united into one. By the bowed window stood a beautiful writing desk with everything ready for use. Upon it was a chaste golden bowl whose spicy odour I had been dimly conscious of for some time. It's my brother's desk, and his favourite flowers. Here we never forget the tastes and preferences of those we love. The entire apartment was beautiful beyond description, but I had seen it many times before I was fully able to comprehend its perfect completeness. Only one picture hung upon the walls, and that was a life-size portrait of the Christ just opposite the couch. It was not an artist's conception of the human Christ, bowed under the weight of the sins of the world, nor yet the thorn-crowned head of the crucified Saviour of mankind, but the likeness of the living Master, of Christ the victorious, of Christ the crowned. The wonderful eyes looked directly and tenderly into your own, and the lips seemed to pronounce the benediction of peace. The ineffable beauty of the divine face seemed to illumine the room with a holy light, and I fell upon my knees and pressed my lips 
to the sandaled feet so truthfully portrayed upon the canvas, while my heart cried, Master, beloved Master and Saviour. It was long before I could fix my attention on anything else. My whole being was full of adoration and thanksgiving for the great love that had guided me into this haven of rest, this wonderful home of peace and joy. Not all the details were at once noticed by me, but they unfolded to me gradually as we lingered talking together. My first sensation upon entering the room was genuine surprise at the sight of the books, and my first words were, Why, have we books in heaven? Why not? asked my brother. What strange ideas we mortals have of the pleasures and duties of the blessed life. We seem to think that death of the body means an entire change to the soul, but that is not the case by any means. We bring to this life the same tastes, the same desires, the same knowledge we had before death. What would be the use of our oftentimes long lives given to the pursuit of certain worthy and legitimate knowledge if at death it counts for nothing and we begin this life on a wholly different line of thought and study. No, no. Would that all would understand, as I said before, that we are building for eternity during our earthly life. The purer the thought, the nobler the ambitions, the loftier the aspirations, the higher the rank we take among the hosts of heaven. The more earnestly we follow the studies and duties in the life of probation, the better fitted we shall be to carry them forward on and on to completion and perfection here. But the books, who writes them? Are any of them books we knew and loved below? Undoubtedly many of them, all indeed that in any way help to elevate the human mind or immortal soul. Then many of the rarest minds in the earth life, upon entering this higher life, gain such elevated and extended views of the subjects that have been their lifelong studies that, exploring them with zest, they write out for the benefit of those less gifted the higher, stronger views they themselves acquired, thus remaining leaders and teachers in this rarer life as they were while yet in the world. It is not to be expected that the great souls of those who've recently joined our ranks and who uplifted so many lives while on earth should lay aside their pens. When they have learned their lessons well, they will write them out for the benefit of those less gifted who must follow. Leaders there always must be, in this divine life as in the former life. Leaders and teachers in many varied lines of thought. But all this knowledge will come to you simply and naturally as you grow into this new life. After a short rest in this lovely room among the books, my brother took me through all the remaining rooms of the house, each perfect and beautiful in its own way, and each distinctly and imperishably photographed upon my memory. Of only one other will I speak at this time, as he drew aside the gauzy draperies, lined with the most delicate shade of amber which hung before the columned doorway of a lovely room on the second floor of the house, he said, Your own special place for rest and study. The entire second story of the house indoors, instead of being made of grey marble, as was the first floor, was finished with inlaid wood of fine satiny texture and rare polish, and the room we now entered was exquisite both in design and finish. It was oblong in shape, with a large bowed window at one end, similar to those in the library, a portion of which was directly below this room. Within this window on one side stood a writing desk of solid ivory with silver furnishings and opposite was a case of well-filled bookshelves of the same material. 
Among the books I found afterward were many of my favorite authors. Rich rugs of silver gray in color lay scattered over the floor, and all the hangings in the room were of the same delicate hue and texture as those at the entrance. The framework of the furniture was of ivory, the upholstering of the chairs of silver gray cloth, with the finish of the finest satin and the pillows and covering of the dainty couch were of the same. Several graceful vases were filled with roses. After some time in this delightful place, we passed through the open window onto the marble terrace. The stairway of artistically finished marble wound gracefully down from this terrace to the lawn beneath the trees. The fruit-laden branches of the trees hung within easy reach from the terrace, and I noticed as I stood there that morning seven varieties. One kind resembled our Bartlett pear, only much larger, and infinitely more delicious to the taste as I soon found. Another variety was in clusters, the fruit also pear-shaped, but smaller than the former, and the consistency and flavor similar to the finest frozen cream. It seemed to me at the time, and really proved to be so, the great variety and excellence of food was provided without labor or care. My brother gathered some of the different varieties and bade me try them. I did so with relish and refreshment. Once the rich juice from the pear-like fruit ran out profusely over my hands and the front of my dress. Oh, I said, I've ruined my dress, I fear. My brother laughed genially as he said, Show me the stains. To my amazement, not a spot could I find. Look at your hands, he said. I found them clean and fresh, as though just from the bath. What does it mean? My hands were covered with the thick juice of the fruit. Simply, he answered, that no impurity can remain for an instant in the air. Nothing decays, nothing tarnishes, nor in any way disfigures nor mars the universal purity or beauty of this place. As soon as the fruit ripens and falls, all that is not immediately gathered at once evaporates, not even the seed remaining. I had noticed that no fruit lay beneath the trees. This, then, was the reason for it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, I quoted thoughtfully. Yes, even so, he answered, even so. We descended the steps and again entered the flower room. As I stood once more admiring the inlaid roses, my brother asked, Whom of all the friends you have in heaven do you wish most to see? My father and mother, I answered quickly. He smiled so significantly that I hastily turned, and there, advancing up the long room to meet me, I saw my dear father and mother, and with them, my younger sister. With a cry of joy, I flew into my father's outstretched arms and heard with a thrill of joy his dear familiar, my precious little daughter. At last, at last, I cried, clinging to him, at last I have you again. At last, he echoed with a deep-drawn breath of joy. Then he resigned me to my dear mother and we were soon clasped in each other's embrace. My precious mother, my dear child, we cried simultaneously. And my sister, enfolding us both in her arms, exclaimed with a happy cry, I cannot wait, I'll not be left outside. And disengaging one arm, I threw it around her neck and drew her into the happy circle of our united love. 
Oh, what an hour was that! I did not dream that even heaven could hold such joy. After a time, my brother, who had shared our joy, said, Now I can safely leave you for a few hours to this blessed reunion, for I have other work before me. Yes, said my father, you must go. We will with joy take charge of our dear child. And for a brief while, goodbye, said my brother kindly. Do not forget that rest, especially to one but recently entered upon the new life, is not only one of the pleasures, but one of the duties of heaven. Yes, we will see that she does not forget that, said my father with a kindly smile and glance. After my brother's departure, my mother said, grasping my hand, Come, I'm eager to have you in our own home. We all passed out of the rear entrance, walked a few hundred yards across the soft turf, and entered a lovely home, somewhat similar to our own, yet unlike it in many details. Every room spoke of modest refinement and taste, and the home air about it was at once delightfully perceptible. My father's study was on the second floor, and the first thing I noticed on entering was the luxuriant branches and flowers of a rose tree that covered the window by his desk. Ah, I cried, I can almost imagine myself in your old study at home when I look out that window. Is it not a reminder? he said, laughing happily. I almost think sometimes that it's the same dear old bush transplanted here. It seems this ought to be your home, dear. It's our father's home, said my sister wistfully. Nay, my father quickly interspersed, Colonel Springer is her legitimate guardian and instructor. It is a wise and admirable arrangement. He is in every way the most suitable instructor she could possibly have. Our father never errs. Her brother stands very near the master. Few have a clearer knowledge of the divine will, hence few are better fitted for instructors. But I too have duties that call me for a time away. How blessed to know that there can never again be long separations. You will have two homes now, dear child, your own and ours. At this moment a swift messenger approached my father and spoke a few low words. Yes, I'll go at once, he replied, and waving his hand in adieu, departed with the angelic guide. My mother said, He's called usually to those who enter life with little preparation, that which on earth is called deathbed repentance. You know what a wonderful success he always had with winning souls to Christ, and these Poor spirits need to be taught from the very beginning. They enter the spirit life in its lowest phase, and it's your father's pleasant duty to lead them upward step by step. He is devoted to his work, and greatly beloved by those he thus helps. He allows me often to accompany him and labor with him, and that is such a pleasure to me. And you know, she said with a look of happiness, I never forget anything now. It had been her great burden for some years before her death that her memory failed her sadly, and I could understand and sympathize with her present delight. A little later my sister drew me tenderly aside and whispered, Tell me of my little boy, my precious son. I often see him, but we're not permitted to know as much of the earth life as we once believed we should. The Father's wisdom meets out to us knowledge as He sees best, and we're content to wait upon His time for more. All you can tell us would not be denied me. Is He surely coming to me sometime? Shall I hold Him again in my arms, my darling boy? I'm sure, yes, I'm sure you will. Your memory is very precious to Him. Then I told her all I could recall of the son with whom she parted while he was yet a child now grown to a man's estate, honoured and loved, with a home and wife and son to comfort and bless him. Then I can wait, she said, if he's sure to come to me at last when his earthly work is done 
bringing his wife and son. Now I shall love them too. At this moment I felt myself encircled by tender arms, and a hand was laid gently on my eyes. Who is it? Someone whispered softly. Oh, I know the voice, the touch. Dearest, dearest, kneel, I cried, and turning quickly, threw my arms around the neck of my only brother. He gathered me warmly to his heart. Then, in his old-time playful way, he lifted me quite off my feet in his strong arms. After some words, he said, But come now, they've had you long enough for the first visit. The rest of us want you for a while. Mother, may I have them both for a little time, may I not? Or will you come too? Turning to my mother with a caressing touch, I cannot go, dear boy. I must be here when your father returns. Take your sisters. It is a blessed sight to see you all together again. Come then, he said, and each taking one of my hands, we went out together. After a short walk, we stopped abruptly in front of a dainty house built of the finest polished woods. It was beautiful, both in architecture and finish. I paused a moment on the wide veranda to examine a vine wreathed about the columns of highly polished wood, and my brother laughingly said to my sister, She's the same old sis. We'll not get much good out of her until she's learned the name of every flower, vine, and plant in heaven. Stepping inside the lovely vestibule, out of which opened from every side spacious rooms, he called softly, Alma! At once, from one of these, a fair woman approached us. My dear child, I said, it has not seemed possible. You were but a child when I last saw you. She's still her father's girl, said my brother with a fond look. She and Carrie, whom you never saw, make a blessed home for me. Where is your sister, daughter? She's at the great music hall. She has a very rich voice that she's cultivating, Alma said, turning to me. We were going to find our aunt when she returned, she added. Then they showed me their lovely home, perfect and charming in every detail. When we came out upon a side veranda, I saw we were so near an adjoining house that we could easily step from one veranda to another. My brother lifted me lightly over the intervening space. There's someone here you will wish to see. The house we entered was almost identical in construction and finish with that of my brother Neil. And as we entered, three persons came eagerly forward to greet me. It was my father's sister, always a favorite aunt, with her son and his wife. How we did talk and cling to one another and ask and answer questions. It's so nice to have Dr. Neil so near to us. We're almost one household, as you see. All felt we must be together. It is indeed, I answered, although you no longer need him in his professional capacity. No, thanks to the father, we need him quite as much in other ways. I think I'm the one to be grateful, said my brother. But, sister, I promised Frank that you should go to your own room. He thought it wise that you should be left alone for a while. Shall we go now? Then my brother went with me to my own home, with a loving embrace, left me at the door of my room. Once within, I lay down upon my couch to think over the events of this wonderful day. I forgot all else, and Christ's peace enfolding me like a mantle. I rested. While I lay in this blissful rest, my brother Frank returned and, without rousing me, bore me in his strong arms again to earth. I did not know when he left us in our home upon what mission he was going, though my father knew it was to return to my dear husband and accompany him upon his sad journey to his dead wife, to comfort and sustain and strengthen him in those first lonely hours of sorrow. 
They thought it best for wise reasons that I should wait a while before returning and taste the blessedness of the new life, thus gaining strength for the trial before me. When I roused from my sleep, it was in the grey light of earth's morning, and I was standing on the doorstep of the house in Kentville that my brother and I had left together some thirty-six hours before, reckoned by earth time. I shuddered a little with a strange chill when I saw where we were, and turned quickly to my brother Frank, who stood beside me. He put his arm about me, and with a reassuring smile said, For their sakes, be brave and strong, and try to make them understand your blessed change. I did not try to answer, though I took heart and entered with him into the house. Everything was very quiet. No one seemed astir. My brother softly opened a door immediately to the right of the entrance and motioned me to enter. I did so, and he closed it behind me, remaining himself outside. Something stood in the center of the room, and I soon discovered that it was a pall. It was a great relief to me to see that it was not black, but a soft shade of grey. Someone was kneeling beside it. As I slowly approached, I saw it was my dear son. He was kneeling upon one knee, with his elbow resting on the other knee, and his face buried in his hand. One arm was thrown across the casket, as though he were taking a last embrace of his little mother. I saw that the form within the casket lay as though peacefully sleeping, and was clad in silver and grey, with soft white folds about the neck and breast. I was grateful that they had remembered my wishes so well. I put my arms around the neck of my darling son, and drew his head gently against my breast, resting my cheek upon his bowed head. Then I whispered, Dearest, I'm here beside you, living, breathing, strong and well. Will you not turn to me instead of to that lifeless form in the casket? It is only the worn-out tenement. I am your living mother. He lifted his head as though listening, then laying his hand tenderly against the white face in the casket, he whispered, Poor dear little mother, and again dropped his face into both hands while his form shook with convulsive sobs. As I strove to comfort him, the door opened and his lovely wife entered. I turned to meet her as she came slowly towards us. Midway in the room we met, and, taking both her hands tenderly in mine, I whispered, Comfort him, darling girl, as only you can. He needs human love. She paused a moment irresolutely, looking directly into my eyes, then passed on and knelt beside him, laying her upturned face against his shoulder. I saw his arm steal around her and draw her closely to him. Then I passed from the room, feeling comforted that they were together. Outside the door, I paused an instant. Then, slowly ascending the stairs, I entered the once familiar room whose door was standing ajar. All remained as when I had left it, save that no still form lay upon the white bed. As I expected, I found my precious husband in this room. He sat near the bay window, his arm resting upon the table, and his eyes bent sorrowfully upon the floor. My best friend sat near him and seemed trying to comfort him. When I entered the room, Frank arose from a chair close beside him and passed out with a sympathetic look at me. I went at once to my dear husband, put my arms about him and whispered, Darling, darling, I am here. He stirred restlessly without changing his position. Virginia said, as though continuing a conversation, I am sure she would say that you left nothing undone that could possibly be done for her. She is right. I whispered. 
Still, she was alone at the last, he moaned. Yes, dear, but who could know it was the last? She sang so suddenly under the pain. What can I say to comfort you? Oh, Will, come home with us. She would want you to, I'm sure. He shook his head sadly while the tears were in his eyes as he said, Work is my only salvation. I must go back in a very few days. She said no more, and he leaned back wearily in his easy chair. I crept more closely to him, and suddenly his arms closed about me. I whispered, There, dear, do you not see that I'm really with you? He was very still, and the room was very quiet, but for the ticking of my little clock still standing upon the dressing case. Presently I knew by his regular breathing that he had found a short respite from his sorrow. I slipped gently from his arms and went to my friend, kneeling beside her and folding my arms about her. Virginia! Virginia! You know I'm not dead! Why do you grieve? She looked over at the worn face of the man before her, then dropped her face into her hand, whispering as though she'd heard me and would answer, Oh, darling, how could you leave him? I'm here, dearest. Do you realize that I'm here? She did not heed me, but sat absorbed in sorrowful thought. A few minutes later, a stranger entered the room and in low voice said something about it being near train time, and brought my husband his hat. He arose and gave his arm to Virginia, and our son and his wife, meeting them at the door, they started to descend the stairs. Just then my husband paused and cast one sorrowful glance around the room, his face white with pain. Our dear daughter stepped quickly to him, and placing both arms about his neck, drew his face down to hers. God bless her in all things, I softly prayed. An instant they stood thus, then, stifling his emotion, they all passed down the stairs into the room I had first entered. I kept very close to my dear husband, and never for a single instant left him through all the solemn and impressive services through the sad journey to our old home, the last rites at the grave, the after-meeting with friends, and his final return to the weary routine of labor. How thankful I was that I had been permitted to taste, during that wonderful day in heaven, the joys of the blessed life! How else could I ever have passed calmly through those trying scenes and witness the sorrow of those so dear to my heart. I recognize the wisdom and mercy of the Father in having so ordered it. I soon found that my husband was right. Work was his great refuge. During the day the routine of labor kept brain and hands busy, leaving the heart but little opportunity to indulge its sorrow. Night was his trying time. Kind friends would stay with him till bedtime. After that, he was alone. He would turn restlessly on his pillow, and often arise and go into the adjoining room that had formerly been mine, and gaze upon the vacant bed with tearful eyes. It took all my powers to, in any degree, soothe and quiet him. After a time, my brother Frank and I arranged to spend alternate nights with him, that he might never be alone, and especially were we with him upon his journeys. We found to our great joy that our influence over him was hourly growing stronger, and we were able to guide and help him in many ways. One night, as I was silently watching beside him while he slept many months after he was alone, I became conscious that evil threatened him. He was sleeping very peacefully, and I knew his dreams were happy ones by the smile upon his dear face. I passed into the hall of the hotel where he was staying, and found it dense with smoke. 
I hastened back to him and called and tried to shake him, but he slept on peacefully. Then I called with all my strength, Will! close to his ear. Instantly he started up and said, Yes, dear, I'm coming, just as he used to do when I called at night. Then in a moment he sank back with a sigh upon his pillow, murmuring, What a vivid dream! I never heard a voice more distinctly in life. Will! I again called, pulling him by the hand with all my strength. Rise! Quickly! Your life is in danger! In an instant he was out of bed upon his feet and hurriedly drawing on his clothes. I am sure I cannot tell why I am doing this, he muttered to himself. I only feel that I must. That surely was her voice I heard. Hurry! Hurry! I urged. He opened the door and met not only the smoke, but tongues of flame. Do not try the stairway! Come! And I drew him past the stairway and through a narrow entrance to a second hall beyond, and down a second flight of stairs filled with smoke, but as yet no flame. Another flight still below these, then out into the open air, where he staggered, faint and exhausted, onto the sidewalk and was quickly helped by friends into a place of safety. I am sure I cannot tell what wakened me, he afterwards said to a friend. I dreamed I heard my wife calling me, and before I knew it I was dressing myself. You did hear her, I have no doubt, she said. Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to do service for the sake of them that shall inherit salvation? What lovelier service could she do than to thus save the life of one so dear to her, whose earthwork was not yet done? Yes, you did hear her call you in time to escape. Thank God for such ministrations. Yes, it must be so, he answered with a happy look. Thank God indeed. After this he yielded much more readily to our influence, and thus began to enjoy while yet upon earth, the reunion that so surely awaited us in the blessed life. I often went also to the home of our dear children, but there was so much to make them happy that they did not need me as their father did. Sometimes in hours of great physical prostration, especially during the absence of his wife, I found that I could quiet the overwrought nerves of my dear son and lead his tired mind to restful thoughts, but with youth and strength and love to support him, the time had not yet come when my ministrations were essential. One day I was with my brother Frank when I saw a tall young man looking wistfully at us. A close scrutiny revealed his identity and I exclaimed with joy, extending both hands to him, My dear Carol! He smiled a bright welcome as he extended both hands. Will you come and see the home that is being built for my mother? I looked to my brother for his sanction. He nodded his head pleasantly and said to Carol, I'll leave you two together, and will you bring her to me later? Indeed, yes, said my nephew, and we went away happily together. We soon reached the home, and I was truly charmed with it in every way. It was fashioned much like my brother Neil's home, and like it built of polished woods. It was only partly finished, but was most artistically done. Though uncompleted, I was struck with the fact that everything was perfect as far as finished. There was no debris anywhere, no chips, no shavings, no dust. The wood seemed to be perfectly prepared elsewhere, where I have no idea. The pieces were made to fit accurately, like the parts of a great wooden puzzle. It required much skill and artistic taste to properly adjust each piece to its place. You know, my nephew said, there's no noise from the workmen here, no hammering, no unwelcome sounds. I thought at once of the Temple of Jerusalem where, during its erection, there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house. 
It's very beautiful, my dear boy, I said enthusiastically. But what is this? A fireplace? Is it ever cold enough for fires? It's never cold, he answered, but the fire here never sends out unneeded warmth. We have its cheer and beauty and glow without any of its discomforts. It is charming. But did you not make the stained glass window also? No, I have a friend who's been taught that art, and we exchange work. He helps me with the windows, and I in turn help him with his fine woodwork and inlaying. I'm going to make a flower room for my mother, similar to yours, only of lilies and violets, which will retain their perfume always. How lovely! I want to thank you, dear Carol, for your share in our flower room. It's the most exquisite work I ever saw, and it is doubly so when I remember whose hands fashioned it. It was a labor of love with us all, he said simply. That is what enhances its beauty for me, I said. But sit here by me now and tell me about yourself. Do you spend all your time in this delightful work? Oh, no, indeed. Perhaps what we used to call two or three hours daily. Much of my time is still spent with Grandfather. I do not know what I would have done when I first came here but for him. I was so ignorant about this life and came so suddenly. He met me at the very entrance and took me at once home, where he and Grandma did everything possible to instruct and help me. If I could even go back to the old life for an entire year, if I could only go back to my old friends or better into every Sunday school in the world, and beseech the boys and girls to try to understand and profit by the instruction there received. I used to go to Sunday school, help sing the hymns, read the lessons, listen to all that was said, and I really enjoyed every minute of it. Sometimes I would feel a great longing for a better life, but there seemed to be no one to especially guide me or help me, and the impression made was very transient. Why do not the teachers take more interest in the daily lives of their scholars? Oh, I wish I could go back and tell them this. His face beamed with enthusiasm as he talked, and I too wished it might be possible for him to do as he desired. But alas, neither will they believe the one rose from the dead, I thought. It's time for me to go with my grandfather, he said, arising but we will walk together as far as your home, and you will let me see you often, will you not? Gladly, I answered as we set forth. We conversed of many things as we walked, until we reached my door, and with a word that we would meet again, we parted. As time passed, and I grew more accustomed to the heavenly life about me. I found its loveliness unfolded to me like the slow opening of a rare flower. Delightful surprises met me at every turn. Now a dear friend from whom I had parted years ago in the earth life would come unexpectedly upon me with cordial greeting. Now one, perhaps on earth, greatly admired, but from whom I held aloof, for fear of unwelcome intrusion, would approach me, showing the lovely soul so full of kindness and congenial thought that I would feel a pang of regret for what I had lost. Then the clear revelation of some truth only partly understood in life, though eagerly sought for, would stand out clear and strong before me, overwhelming me with its luster, and perhaps showing the close tie linking the earth life with the divine. But the most wonderful to me was the occasional meeting with someone whom I had hoped to meet over there, who with eager hand clasps and tearful eyes would pour forth his earnest thanks for some helpful word, some solemn warning, or even some stern rebuke that turned him, all unknown to myself, from the paths of sin to life everlasting. 
Oh, the joy to me of such revelation! Oh, the regret that my earth life had not been more full of such work for eternity! For a time each day, I listened to the entrancing revelations and instructions of my brother. One day, as I was on my way to the river, my voice joined to the wonderful anthem of praise everywhere sounding, I saw a lovely girl approaching me swiftly with outstretched arms. Dear Aunt Rebecca, she called as she drew near, do you not know me? My little May, I cried, gathering the dainty creature into my arms. Where did you spring from so suddenly, dear? Let me look at you again, holding her at arm's length, only to draw her again tenderly to me. You've grown very beautiful, my child. I may say this to you without fear, I'm sure. You were always lovely. You're simply radiant now. Is it this divine life? Yes, she said modestly and sweetly, but most of all, being near our Saviour so much. Oh, yes, that's it. Being near Him. That will make any being radiant and beautiful, I said. He's so good to me so generous, so tender. He seems to forget how little I've done to deserve his care. He knows you love him, dear heart. That means everything to him. Love him? Oh, if loving him deserves reward, I'm sure I ought to have every wish of my heart, for I love him a thousandfold better than anything on heaven or earth. I would die for him. The sweet face grew surpassingly radiant and beautiful as she talked. I began to dimly understand the wonderful power of Christ among the redeemed in heaven. The dear child, so lovely in all mortal graces, so full of earth's keenest enjoyments during the whole of her brief life, pure and good as we count goodness below, yet seemingly too absorbed in life's gaieties to think deeply of things she yet in her heart revered and honoured, now in this blessed life counted the privilege of loving Christ, of being near Him beyond every other joy. And now how that love refined and purified the giver. In our conversation she turned to me and asked quickly, when is my Uncle Will coming? My hand closed tightly over hers, and a sob almost arose in my throat, though I answered calmly, That is in God's hands alone. We may not question. Yes, I know his will is always right, but I so long to see my dear Uncle Will again. She'd grown so womanly, so wise, this child of tender years, that it was a joy to speak to her. As we talked, she asked me if I'd seen the lake, and I echoed, Is there a lake here? Certainly, she said with a little pardonable pride that she should know more of the heavenly surroundings than I. And so we turned in the direction of the lake, and passing through ever-varying landscape, we finally came upon it. I caught my breath, then stopped abruptly and covered my face with my hands to shield my eyes from the glorified scene. I looked upon it as one but half awaken. Before us spread a lake as smooth as glass, but flooded with golden glory caught from the very heavens that made it look like a sea of molten gold. The blossom and fruit-bearing trees grew to its very border. Far, far away across its shining waters arose the domes and spires of what seemed to be a mighty city. Many people were resting upon its flowery banks, and on the surface of the water were boats of wonderful structure, filled with happy souls and propelled by 
unseen powers. Above, we saw a band of singing cherubs floating high overhead. Glory and honor, sang the child voices. Dominion and power caught up and answered the voices of the multitudes below. Be unto him who sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb for ever. May slipped her arm about my neck and whispered, Dearest, come. I yielded to her passively. I could not do otherwise. She led me into the water, down, down into its crystal depths. When it seemed to me we must be hundreds of feet beneath the water, she threw herself prostrate and bade me do the same. I did so, and immediately we began to slowly rise. Presently I found that we no longer rose, but were slowly floating in mid-current, many feet still beneath the surface. Then appeared to me a marvel. Look where I would. Perfect prismatic rays surrounded me. I seemed to be resting in the heart of a prism, and such vivid yet delicate colouring mortal eyes never rested upon. Instead of the seven colours as we see them here, the colours blended in such rare graduation of shades as to make the rays seem almost infinite, or they really were so, I could not decide which. As I lay watching this marvellous panorama, for the colours deepened and faded like the lights of the aurora borealis, I was attracted to the sound of distant music. Although May and I no longer clung together, we did not drift apart, as one would naturally suppose we might, but lay within easy speaking distance of each other, although few words were spoken by either of us. The silence seemed too sacred to be lightly broken. We lay upon, or rather within the water, as upon the softest couch. It required no effort whatever to keep ourselves afloat. The gentle undulation of the waves soothed and rested us. When the distant music arrested my attention, I turned and looked at May. She smiled back at me, but did not speak. Presently I caught the words, Glory and honor, dominion and power, and I knew it was still the cherub choir, although they must now be many miles distant. Then the soft tones of a bell, a silver bell with silver tongue, fell on my ear. As the last notes died away, I whispered, Tell me, May. Yes, dear, I will. The waters of this lake catch the light in a most marvellous manner, as you've seen. A wiser head than mine must tell you why. They also transmit musical sounds, only musical sounds, for a great distance. The song was evidently from the distant shore of the lake. And the bell? That is the bell which in the city across the lake calls to certain duties at this hour. There never was a sweeter call to duty, I said. Yes. Its notes are beautiful. Hark! How it rings a chime. We lay and listened, and as we listened a sweet spell wrapped me around, and I slept as peacefully as a child on its mother's bosom. I awoke with a strange sense of invigoration and strength. It was a feeling wholly dissimilar to that experienced during a bath in the river, yet I could not explain how. May said, One takes away the last of the earth life and prepares us for the life upon which we enter. The other fills us to overflowing with a draught from the celestial life itself. We stood upon the margin of the lake. My cheeks were tear bedewed and my eyes were dim with emotion. I felt weak as a little child, but oh, what rapture, what joy unspeakable filled and overmastered me. Was I dreaming? Or was it indeed but another phase of the immortal life? 
As we watched, groups of children played around in joyous freedom, and there were happy shouts of laughter that echoed over the lake. No fear of harm or danger, no dread of ill or anxiety lest a mishap occur. Security and joy and peace. This is a blessed life, I said, as we stood watching the sports of the happy children. I often think how we were taught to believe that heaven was where we would wear crowns of gold and stand with harps always in our hands. Our crowns of gold are the halos his blessed presence casts about us, and we do not need harps to accentuate our songs of praise. We do see the crowns and hear the angelic harps when and if God wills it, but our best worship is to do his blessed will, said May as we turned to go. As we walked, she told me of the history of her years in heaven, her duties, her joys, her friends, her home. I found her home was quite distant from our own, far from the spires of the great city across the lake. But she added, What is distance in heaven? We come and go at will. We feel no fatigue, no haste, experience no delays. It is blessed, blessed. Not far from our home, we saw a group of children playing upon the grass, and in their midst was a beautiful great dog, of which they were rolling and tumbling with the greatest freedom. As we approached, he broke away from them and came bounding to meet us, and crouched and fawned at my very feet with every gesture of glad welcome. Do you not know him, Auntie? May said brightly. It's dear old sport! I cried, stooping and placing my arms about his neck and resting my head on his silken hair. He responded to my caresses with every expression of delight, and May laughed aloud at our mutual joy. I've often wondered if I should not some day find him here. He surely deserves a happy life for his faithfulness and devotion in the other life. His intelligence and his fidelity were far above those of many human beings whom we count immortal. Did he not sacrifice his life for little will? Yes, he attempted to cross the track in front of an approaching train, because he saw it would pass between him and his little master, and feared the boy was in danger. It cost his life. He always placed himself between any of us and threatened danger, but will, he seemed to consider his especial charge. He was a gallant fellow. He deserves immortality. Dear, dear old sport, you shall never leave me again, I said, caressing him fondly. At this he sprang to his feet, barking joyously, and gambled and frolicked before us the rest of the way home, then lay down upon the doorstep with an upward glance and a wag of his bushy tail, as though to say, See how I take you at your word. He understands every word we say, said May. How silken and beautiful his long hair is. He has his bath in the river every day, and it leaves its mark on him also. Do you know, I think one of the sweetest proofs we have of the Father's loving care for us is we so often find in this life the things which gave us great happiness below. The more unexpected this is, the greater joy it brings. I remember once seeing a beautiful little girl enter heaven, the very first to come of a large and affectionate family. I afterward learned that the sorrowful cry of her mother was, Oh, if only we had someone there to meet her, to care for her. She came, lovingly nestled in the master's own arms. And a little later, as he sat still caressing and talking to her, a remarkably fine Angora kitten, of whom the child had been very fond, and which had sickened and died some weeks before, to her great sorrow, came running across the grass and sprang directly into her arms, where it lay contentedly. Such a glad cry as she recognized her little favorite such a hugging and kissing as that little kitten received made joy even in heaven. 
Who but our loving father would have thought of such comfort for a little child? She had evidently been a timid child, but now as the children gathered about her with the delightful freedom they always manifest in the presence of the beloved master, she, looking up confidingly into the tender eyes above her, began to shyly tell of the marvelous intelligence of her little pet, until at last Jesus left her contentedly playing among the flowers with the little companions who had gathered about her. Our Father never forgets us, but provides pleasures and comforts for us all, according to our individual needs. Then we parted, each to the duties of the hour. My brother said to me after an interesting hour of instruction, Shall we go for the promised visit to Mrs. Wickham now? Indeed, yes, I answered eagerly. So we set forth. We soon reached her lovely home and found her waiting at the entrance as though expecting us. After a cordial greeting to our friend, my brother said, I'll leave you together for that long talk for which I know you are both eager and will go my way to other duties. I'll find you later on at home. After he had gone, my friend took me over to her lovely home, showing me with great pleasure the rooms prepared for each beloved member of her earthly household still to come. Returning down the broad stairway, we entered a very large music room with broad walkways supported by marble columns running along three sides of it on a level with the second floor. In this gallery, were a number of musical instruments, harps, viols, and some unlike any I had ever seen elsewhere. My daughter, my friend explained, who left us in early childhood, has received a fine musical training here, and is fond of gathering in her young friends and giving us a musical treat quite often. We re-entered from this room the reception hall opening upon the front veranda and outer steps. Here Mrs. Wickham drew me to a seat beside her and said, Now tell me everything of the dear home and friends. Holding each other's hands as we talked, she questioning, I answering, things too sacred to be repeated here, were dwelt upon for hours. At last, she said, rising hastily, I will leave you for a little while. Nay, you must not go, as I would have arisen. There's much yet to be said. Wait here till I return. I'd already learned not to question the judgment of wise of friends, and yielded to her will. As she passed through the doorway to the inner house, I saw a stranger at the front entrance and arose to meet him. He was tall and commanding in form with a face of indescribable sweetness and beauty. Where had I seen him before? Surely I had not met him since I came. Ah, now I know, I thought, it is St. John, the beloved disciple. He had been pointed out to me one morning by the riverside. Peace be unto this house, was his salutation as he entered. How his voice stirred and thrilled me. No wonder the master loved him, but that voice and that face. Enter, thou art a welcome guest. Enter, and I will call the mistress, I said, as I approached to bid him welcome. Nay, call her not. She knows that I am here. She will return, he said. Sit thou a while beside me he continued as he saw that I still stood after I had seen him seated. He arose and led me to a seat near him, and like a little child I did as I was bidden, still always watching the wonderful face before me. You have but lately come? he asked. 
Yes, I'm here but for a short time, so short that I know not how to reckon time as you count it here, I answered. Oh, that matters little, he said with a gentle smile. Many cling always to the old reckoning in the earth language. How does the change impress you? How do you find life here? Oh, I said, if they could only know. I never fully understood till now the meaning of the sublime passage, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. It is indeed past human conception. I spoke with deep feeling. For them that love him. Do you believe that all Christians truly love him? He asked. Do you think they love the Father for the gift of the Son and the Son because of the Father's love and mercy? Or is their worship oft-times that of duty rather than love? He spoke gently and reflectively. Oh, I said, you who well knew the beloved Master, who was so loved by him, how can you doubt the love that he must inspire in all hearts who seek to know him? A radiant glow overspread the wonderful face, which he lifted, looking directly at me. The mist rolled away from before my eyes, and I knew him. With a low cry of adoration, I threw myself before his feet, bathing them with happy tears. He gently stroked my bowed head for a moment, then rising, lifted me to his side. My Saviour! My King! I whispered, clinging closely to him. Yes, and elder brother and friend, he added, wiping away tenderly the tears stealing from beneath my closed eyelids. Yes, yes, the chiefest among ten thousand, and the one altogether lovely, again I whispered. Ah, now you begin to meet the conditions of the new life. Like many another, the changing of faith to sight with you has engendered a little shrinking. That is all wrong. Have you forgotten the promise I go to prepare a place for you that where I am ye may be also? If you loved me when you could not see me except by faith, love me more now when we have really become co-heirs of the Father. Come to me with all that perplexes or gladdens you. Come to the elder brother, always waiting to receive you with joy. Then he drew me to a seat, and conversed with me long and earnestly, unfolding many of the mysteries of the divine life. I hung upon his words, I drank in every tone of his voice, I watched eagerly upon every line of his beloved face, and I was exalted, uplifted, reborn, beyond the power of words to express. At length, with a divine smile, he arose. We will often meet, he said, and I, bending over, pressed my lips reverently to the hand that still clasped my own. Then, laying his hands a moment in blessing upon my bestowed head, he passed noiselessly and swiftly from the house. As I stood watching the Saviour's fast receding figure passing beneath the flower-laden trees, I saw two beautiful young girls approaching the way he went. With arms intertwined they came, sweet Mary Bates and May Camden. When they saw the master, with a glad cry, they flew to him, and as he joyously extended a hand to each, they turned, each clinging to his hand, one upon either side, accompanied him on his way, looking up trustfully into his face as he talked with them, and apparently conversing with him, in happy freedom. I saw his face from time to time in profile as he turned and looked down lovingly, first upon one, then the other lovely upturned face, and I thought, that is the way he would have us be with him, really like children with a beloved elder brother.
I watched them till the trees hid them from my sight, and I passed softly through the house to the beautiful entrance at the rear. Just before I reached the door, I met my friend, Mrs. Wickham. Before I could speak, she said, I know all about it. Do not try to speak. I know your heart is full. I'll see you very soon. There, go. And she nudged me gently to the door. How my heart blessed her, for it indeed seemed sacrilege to try to talk on ordinary topics after this blessed experience. I did not follow the walk, but went across the flowery turf beneath the trees until I reached home. I found my brother sitting upon the veranda, and as I ascended the steps he arose to meet me. When he looked up into my face, he took both my hands into his for an instant and simply said very gently, Ah, I see. You have been with the master, and stepped aside almost reverently for me to enter the house. I hastened to my room and, dropping the draperies behind me at the door, I threw myself upon the couch and with closed eyes lived over every instant I had spent in that hallowed presence. I recalled every word and tone of the Saviour's voice and fastened the instructions he had given me indelibly upon my memory. I seemed to have been lifted up to a higher plane of existence, to have drunk deeper draughts from the fountain of all good, since I had met him whom my soul loveth. It was a long, blessed communion that I held thus with my own soul on that hallowed day. When at last I arose, the soft golden twilight was about me, and I knelt by my couch to offer my first prayer in heaven. Up to this point my life had been a constant thanksgiving there seemed to be no room for petition. Now, as I knelt, all I could utter over and over was, I thank thee, blessed Father, I thank thee, I thank thee. When at last I descended the stairs, I found my brother standing in the great flower room. Oh, what a life! What a divine life! I whispered to him. You are only in the first pages of its record, he said. Its blessedness must be gradually unfolded to us, or we could not even here bear its dazzling glory. Frank, what do you do in heaven when you want to pray? We praise, he answered. Then let us praise now, I said. And standing there with clasped hands, we lifted up our hearts and voices in a hymn of praise to God. My brother, with his clear, strong voice leading, I following. As the first notes sounded, I thought the roof echoed them. But I soon found that other voices blended with ours until the whole house seemed filled with unseen singers. Such a grand hymn of praise earth never heard. And as the hymn went on, I recognized many dear voices from the past. Will Griggs' tenor, Mary Alice's exquisite soprano, and many another voice that wakened memories of the long ago. Then, as I heard sweet child voices and looked up, I saw above us such a cloud of radiant baby faces has flooded my heart with joy. The room seemed filled with them. As we walked on slowly, conversing about the earth life, she asking eager little questions, I answering as best I could, we saw a group of four persons, three women and a man, standing a little to one side of the walk. The man's back was towards us, but we at once recognized the master. The women were all strangers, and one of them seemed to have just arrived. 
The Saviour held her hand as he talked with her, while all were intently listening to his words. We regarded the group in silence as we slowly passed, not hoping for recognition from him at such a time. But just as we were opposite to them, he turned and looked upon us. He did not speak, but oh, that look! So full of tenderness and encouragement and benediction. It lifted us, it bore us upward, it enthralled and exalted us, and as we passed onward, the clasp of our hands tightened, and rapture unspeakable filled our hearts. After a while, I whispered half to myself, Was there ever such a look? Instantly, Mary raised her head, and looking at me, questioned eagerly, You think so too? I was sure you would. It is always just so. If he's too engaged to speak to you at the time, he just looks at you, and it's as though he had talked a long while with you. Is he not wonderful? Why could we not know him on earth as we know him here? How long were you here before you met him? I asked. Oh, that's the wonderful part of it. His was the first face I looked upon after I left the body. I felt bewildered when I first realized that I was free and stood for a minute uncertain what to do. Then I saw him standing just beside me with that same look upon his face. At first I felt timid and half afraid. Then he stretched forth his hand to me and said gently, My child, I have come to take care of you. Trust me, do not be afraid. Then I knew him. Instantly all fear left me, and I clung to him as I would have done to either of my brothers. He did not say much to me, but somehow I felt he understood all my thoughts. And so we talked until twilight fell. Often the question has been asked whether there was night there. Emphatically, no. What we call day was full of glorious radiance, a roseate golden light which was everywhere. There's no language known to mortals that can describe this marvellous glory. It flooded the sky. After a period much longer than our longest earthly day, this glory mellowed and softened until it became a glowing twilight full of peace. The children ceased their playing beneath the trees, the little birds nestled among the vines, and all who'd been busy in various ways throughout the day sought rest and quiet. But there was no darkness, no dusky shadows, only a restful softening of the glory. Not long after this, my brother said, We shall go to the Grand Auditorium this morning. It'll be a rare day, even here. Martin Luther is the talk. This will be supplemented by a talk from John Wesley. There may also be other speakers. It was not the first time we'd visited this great auditorium, although I have not hitherto described it. It stood upon a slight hill, and the mighty dome was supported by massive columns of alternate amethyst and jasper. There were no walls to the vast edifice, only the great dome and supporting columns. A broad platform of precious marbles inlaid in beautiful crystalline stones arose from the center from which the seats ascended on three sides, forming an immense amphitheater. The seats were of highly polished cedar wood, and back of the platform were heavy hangings of royal purple. An altar of solid pearl stood near the center of the platform. The great dome was deep and dark in its immensity, so that only the golden statues around its lower border were distinctly visible. All this I had noted from former visits. When we entered, 
we found a building filled with people eagerly awaiting for what was to follow. We soon were seated and also waiting. Soft strains of melody floated about us from an invisible choir, and before long, Martin Luther, in the prime of vigorous manhood, ascended the steps and stood before us. It is not my purpose to dwell upon his appearance, so familiar to us all, except to say that his great intellect and spiritual strength seemed to have added to his already powerful physical physique, and made him a fit leader still, even in heavenly places. His discourse would itself fill a volume, and could not be given even in outline in this brief sketch. He held us enthralled by the power of his will and of his eloquence. When at length he retired, John Wesley took his place, and the saintly beauty of his face, intensified by the heavenly light upon it, was wonderful. His discourse theme was God's love, and if in the earth life he dwelt upon it with power, he now swept our souls with the fire of his exaltation until we were as wax in his hands. He showed what that love had done for us, and how an eternity of thanksgiving and praise could never repay it. Silence, save for the faint sweet melody of the unseen choir, rested upon the vast audience for some time after he had left. All seemed lost in contemplation of the theme so tenderly dwelt upon. Then the heavy curtains back of the platform parted, and a tall form, about whom all the glory of heaven seemed to center, emerged from their folds and advanced towards the middle of the platform. Instantly, the vast concourse of souls arose to their feet and burst forth as with one voice into that grand anthem in which we had so often joined on earth. All hail to the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Such a grand chorus of voices, such unity, such harmony, such volume was never heard on earth. It rose, it swelled, it seemed to fill not only the great auditorium, but heaven itself. And still, above it all, we heard the voices of the angel choir, no longer breathing the soft, sweet melody, but bursting forth into fervent songs of triumphant praise. A flood of glory seemed to fill the place, and looking upward, we beheld the great dome ablaze with golden light and the angelic forms of the no longer invisible choir in its midst, with their heavenly harps and vials, and their faces only a little less radiant than that of him whose praise they sang. And he, before whom all heaven bowed in adoration, stood with uplifted face and kingly manner, the very God of heaven and earth. He was the center of all light, and a divine radiance surrounded him that was beyond compare. As the hymn of praise and adoration ceased, all sank slowly to their knees, and every head was bowed and every face was covered as the angel choir chanted again the familiar words, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall ever be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Slowly the voices died away, and a holy silence fell upon us. Presently, slowly and reverently, all arose and resumed their places. No, not all. Sweet Mary Bates had accompanied us to the sanctuary and I now noticed that she alone still knelt in our midst with clasped hands 
and radiant, uplifted face. Her lovely eyes fixed upon the Saviour as he still stood waiting before us. With such a look of self forgetful adoration and love as made her truly divine. She was so rapt I dared not disturb her. But in a moment the master turned and met her adoring eyes with such a look of loving recognition that with a deep sigh of satisfied desire as he turned again, she quietly resumed her seat beside me, slipping her little hand in mine with all the confidence of a child who feels sure it is understood to the utmost. As I looked upon the glorious form before us, clothed in all the majesty of the Godhead, my heart tremblingly asked, Can this indeed be Christ, whom Pilate condemned to die an ignominious death upon the cross? I could not accept it. It seemed impossible that any man, however vile, could be blind to the divinity so plainly revealed in him. Then the Saviour began to speak, and the sweetness of his voice was far beyond the melody of the heavenly choir, and his gracious words. Would that I could, would that I dared, transcribe them as they fell from his lips. Earth has no language by which I could convey their lofty meaning. He first touched lightly upon the earth life, and showed so wonderfully the link of the light uniting the two lives, the past with the present. Then he unfolded to us some of the earlier mysteries of the blessed life, and pointed out the joyous beauties just before us. When he ceased, we sat with bowed heads as he withdrew. Our hearts were so enfolded, our souls so uplifted, our spirits so exalted, our whole being so permeated with his divinity that when we arose, we left the place silently and reverently, each bearing away a heart filled with higher, more divine aspirations and clearer views of the blessed life upon which we were permitted to enter. I can touch but lightly upon these heavenly joys. There is a depth, a mystery to all that pertains to the divine life that I dare not try to transcribe. I could not if I would. I would not if I could. A sacredness enfolds all that curious eyes should not look upon. Suffice it to say that no joy we know on earth, however rare, however sacred, can be more than the faintest shadow of the joy we there find. No dreams of rapture, here unrealized, approach the bliss of even one moment in that divine world. No sorrow, no pain, no sickness, no death, no partings, no disappointments, no tears but those of joy, no broken hopes, no mislaid plans, no night, nor storm, nor shadows even, but light and joy and love and peace and rest forever and forever. Amen, my heart says again reverently. Amen. As the days passed, I found my desires often led me to the sacred lake, sometimes alone, sometimes with one or more of my own family circle, my revered father and precious mother, my dear brother and sister, and many beloved friends. It was always to me an inspiration and an uplifting. I never could grow sufficiently familiar with it to overcome the first great awe with which it inspired me. But I found that the oftener I bathed or floated and slept in its crystal-clear current, the stronger I grew in spirit. 
and the more clearly I comprehended the mysteries of the world about me. My almost daily intercourse with the dear ones of our home life from whom I had so long been separated served to restore to me the home feeling that had been the greatest solace of my mortal life. And I began to realize that this was indeed the true life, instead of that probationary life which we had always regarded as such. One day, as I started to cross the lawn lying between my father's house and our own, I heard my name called in affectionate tones. I turned and saw approaching me a tall, fine-looking man whose uncovered head was silvery white and whose deep blue eyes looked happily and tenderly into mine as he grew nearer. Oliver! I cried with outstretched arms of welcome. Dear, dear Oliver! It was the husband of my eldest sister, always dearly loved. As I went on, I met a group of happy young girls and boys of different ages hastening past me. As soon as they saw me, they all with one accord began to shout joyfully, Grandma is coming! Grandma is coming! We're taking flowers to scatter everywhere! We're so glad! With a great joy in my heart, I hastened onward to my father's house. I found them awaiting me, full of joyful expectation. We set forth a goodly company to welcome this dearly beloved loved one to her home. As we approached the house, we heard the sound of joyous voices, and looking in, we saw my sister standing in the room, her husband's arm around her, and the happy grandchildren thronging around them. And what was this? Could this radiant creature, with smooth brow and happy eyes, be the pale, wan woman I had last seen, so bowed with suffering and sorrow? I looked with eager eyes. Yes, it was my sister. But as she was full thirty years ago, with the bloom of health upon her face and the light of youth in her tender eyes, I drew back into the shadow of the vines and let the others precede me, for my heart was full of a strange, triumphant joy. This truly was the victory over death, so surely promised by our risen Lord. I watched the happy greetings and the way she took each beloved one into her tender arms. When, one by one, she'd greeted and embraced them all, I saw her, with a strange yearning at my heart, turn and look wistfully around and then whisper to my father, Is not my little sister here? I could wait no longer, but hastening to her side said, Dearest, I am here. Welcome, welcome. She folded me to her heart and held me fast in her warm arms. She showered kisses on my upturned face while I returned each loving caress and laughed and cried for gladness that she had come at last. Oh, what a family reunion was that inside the walls of heaven! And how its bliss was heightened by the sure knowledge that there should be no partings for us henceforth, ever. I turned to Oliver and said, Does she not look very young to you? Then I added, noting his fresh complexion and his sparkling eyes, Her coming has brought youth likewise to you. He looked at me intently, then said, I wonder if you realize the change that has likewise come to you in this wonderful climb. I? I asked, a little startled at the thought. I confess I have not thought once of my personal appearance. I realize what through the Father's mercy this life has done for me spiritually, but as for the other, I have never given it an instant's thought. The change is fully as great in your case as in Lou's, though with you the change has been more gradual. I felt a strange thrill of joy that when my dear husband should come to me, he would find me with the freshness and comeliness of our earlier years. It was a sweet thought, and my heart was full of gratitude to the Father for this further evidence of his loving care. 
So the hours passed and the time came for us to go. With light hearts we went on our way and left them to spend their first hours in heaven together. After we had left my parents and friends on our return from our welcome to my sister, my brother hastened away upon some mission, and I walked on alone toward the sacred lake. I felt the need of a rest in its soothing waters after the exciting scenes through which I had passed. I had hitherto visited the lake in the early morning hours. It was now something past noontide of the heavenly day, and but few persons lingered on the shore. The boats that sped across its calm surface seemed to be filled rather with those intent upon some duty than simply pleasure-seekers. I walked slowly down into the water, and soon found myself floating, as in former times, in mid-current. The wonderful prismatic rays that in the early morning were such a marvel, now blended into a golden glory, with different shades of rose and purple flashing in their splendor. To me it seemed even more beautiful than the rainbow tints, just as the mature joys of our earthly life cast into shadow somewhat the more fleeting pleasures of youth. I could but wonder what its evening glories would be, and resolved to come at some glowing twilight and see if they would not remind me of the calm hours of life's closing day. I heard the chimes from the silver bell of the great city ringing an anthem as I lay, and its notes seemed to chant clearly, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The waters took up the song, and a thousand waves about me responded, Holy, holy, holy. The notes seemed to vibrate, if I may use the expression, upon the waves, producing a wondrously harmonious effect. The front row in the battalion of advancing waves softly chanted, Holy, as they passed onward. Immediately the second roll of waves took up the word that the first seemed to have dropped as it echoed the second holy in the divine chorus. Then it, too, passed onward to take up the second note as the third advancing column caught the first. And so it passed and echoed from wave to wave, until it seemed millions of tiny waves about me had taken up and were bearing their part in this grand crescendo, this wonderful anthem. Language fails me. I cannot hope to convey to others this experience as it came to me. It was grand, wonderful, overpowering. I lay and listened until my whole being was filled with the divine melody, and I seemed to be a part of the great chorus. Then I too lifted up my voice and joined with full heart in the thrilling song of praise. I found that, contrary to my usual custom, I floated rapidly away from the shore whence I had entered the water, and after a time was conscious that I was approaching a portion of the lake shore I had never yet visited. Refreshed and invigorated, I ascended the sloping banks, to find myself in the midst of a lovely suburban village, similar to the one where our own home was situated. There was some difference in the architecture or construction of the houses, though they were no less beautiful than others I had seen. Many were constructed of polished woods, and somewhat resembled the finest of the chalets one sees in Switzerland, though far surpassing them in all that gives pleasure to the artistic eye. As I wandered on, feasting my eyes upon the lovely views about me, I was particularly pleased by the appearance of an unusually attractive house. Its broad verandas almost overhung the waters of the lake, 
the wide, low steps running on one side of the house quite to the water's edge. Several graceful swans were leisurely drifting about with the current, and a bird, similar to a southern mockingbird, but with softer voice, was singing and swinging in the low branches overhead. There were many larger and more imposing villas near, but none possessed for me the charm of this sweet home. Beneath one of the large flowering trees close by this cottage home, I saw a woman sitting, weaving with her delicate hands, apparently without shuttle or needle, a snow-white gossamer-like fabric that fell in a soft fleecy heap at her side as the work progressed. She was so very small in stature that at first glance I suppose she was a child, but a closer scrutiny showed her to be a mature woman, though with the glow of youth still upon her smooth cheek. Something familiar in her gestures, rather than her appearance, caused me to feel it was not the first time we had met and growing accustomed now to the delightful surprises that met me everywhere in this world of rare delights, I drew near to accost her, when, before I could speak, she looked up, and the doubt was gone. Maggie! Mrs. Springer, dear! we cried simultaneously, as, dropping her work from her hands, she stepped quickly up to greet me. Our greeting was warm and fervent, and her sweet face glowed with a welcome that reminded me of the happy days when we had met in the years long ago by the shore of that other beautiful lake in the world of our earth life. Now I know why I came this way today, to find you, dear, I said, as we sat side by side, talking as we never had talked on earth for the sweet shyness of her mortal life had melted away in the balmy air of heaven. What is this lovely fabric you're weaving? I presently asked, lifting the silken fleecy web in my fingers as I spoke. Some draperies for Nellie's room, she said. You know, we two have lived alone together so much, I thought it would seem more like home to her, to us both, if we did the same here. So this cottage is our own special home, just a step from Marie's. Pointing to an imposing house a few yards distant, and I'm fitting it up as daintily as I can, especially her room. Oh, let me help you, Maggie, dear, I said. It will be such a pleasure to me. She hesitated an instant with something of the old-time shyness, then said, That is so like you, dear Mrs. Springer. I've set my heart on doing Nellie's room entirely by myself. There's no hurry about it, you know. But if you really would enjoy it, I shall love to have you help me in the other rooms. And will you teach me how to weave these delicate hangings? Yes, indeed. Shall I give you your first lesson now? Lifting the dainty thread, she showed me how to toss and wind it through my fingers till it fell away in shining folds. It was very light and fascinating work, and I soon was weaving it almost as rapidly as she did. Now I can help Carol, was my happy thought, as I saw the shimmering fabric grow beneath my hands. Tomorrow I will go and show him how beautifully we can drape the doors and windows. So in heaven, our first thought ever is to give pleasure to others. You are an apt scholar, said Maggie, laughing happily, and what a charming hour you've given me. What a charming hour you've given me, my dear, I answered. When we parted, it was with the understanding that every little while I was to repeat the visit. When I urged her likewise to come to me, the old-time shyness again appeared as she said, Oh, they're all strangers to me, and here we shall be entirely alone. You come to me. So I yielded, as in heaven we never seek to gain reluctant consent for any pleasure, however dear. And many were the happy hours 
spent with her in the cottage by the lake. In one of my walks about this time, I chanced upon a scene that brought to mind what May had said to me about the Savior's love for little children. I found him sitting beneath one of the flowering trees upon the lake shore, with about a dozen children of all ages clustered around him. One dainty little tot, not more than a year old, was nestled in his arms, with her sunny head resting confidingly upon his bosom, her tiny hands filled with lovely water lilies that floated everywhere on the waters. She was too young to realize how great her privilege was, but seemed to be enjoying his care to the utmost. The others sat at his feet or leaned upon his knees, and one dear little fellow with earnest eyes stood by him leaning upon his shoulder, while the master's right arm encircled him. Every eye was fixed eagerly upon Jesus, and each child appeared alert to catch every word he said. He seemed to be telling them some very absorbing story adapted to their childish tastes and capacities. I sat down upon the grass among a group of people a little removed from the children and tried to hear what he was saying, but we were too far away to catch more than a sentence now and then. And in heaven, one never intrudes upon another's privileges or pleasures. So we simply enjoyed the smiles and eager questions and exclamations of the children and gathered a little of the tenor of the story from the disjointed sentences which floated to us. A little child, lost in the dark woods of the lower world, we heard the master say in response to the inquiring looks of the interested children. Lions and bears came later on. Where was his papa? asked an anxious voice. We could not hear the reply, but soon a little fellow, leaning upon the Saviour's knee, said confidently, No unfriendly lions and bears up here. No, he replied, nothing to harm or frighten my little children here. Then as the story deepened and grew in interest, and the children pressed more closely about the master, he turned with a sweet smile, and we could see an increased pressure on the encircling arm to the little fellow with the earnest eyes who leaned upon his shoulder and said, What, Leslie, would you have done then? With a bright light in his eyes and a flush on his fair cheeks, the child answered quickly and emphatically, I should have prayed to thee and asked thee to close the lion's mouth as thou didst for Daniel, and thou wouldst have done it. Ah, I thought, could his parents see the look the beloved master cast upon their boy as he made his brave reply? They would be comforted even for the loss of their darling. Lost in these thoughts, I heard no more that passed until an ecstatic shout from the little folks proclaimed how satisfactorily the story had ended up. And, looking up, I saw the Saviour passing onward, with the baby still in his arms, and the children trooping about him. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. How well he understood, how much he loved them. Two arose and started homeward. I had not gone far before I met my brother Frank, who greeted me with, I'm on my way to the city by the lake. Will you accompany me? It has long been my wish to visit the city. I only waited until you thought it wise for me to go, I answered. You're growing so fast in the knowledge of the heavenly ways, he said, that I think I might venture to take you almost anywhere with me now. You acquire knowledge for the very love of it not because you feel it your duty to know what we would have you learn. 
your eagerness to gather to yourself all truth and at the same time your patient submission in waiting, of times when I know the trial is great, have won you much praise and love from our dear Master, who watches eagerly the progress of us all in the divine life. I think it only right that you should know of this. We need encouragement here as well as in the earth life, though in a different way. I tell you this by divine permission. I think it will not be long before he trusts you with a mission. But this I say of myself, not by his command. It would be impossible for me to convey, in the language of the earth, the impression these words of commendation left upon me. It was so unexpected, so unforeseen. I had gone on, as my brother said, eagerly gathering the knowledge imparted to me, with a genuine love for the study of all things pertaining to the blessed life, without a thought that I in any way deserved commendation for so doing. And now I had won the warm approval of the Master himself. The happiness seemed almost more than I had strength to bear. My brother, my dear brother, was all I could say in my deep joy, stopping suddenly and looking up into his face with grateful tears. I am so glad for you, little sister, he said warmly, clasping my hand. There are, you see, rewards in heaven. It does my soul good that you have unconsciously won one of these so soon. I would I might recall in detail the precious words of wisdom that fell from the Master's lips. I would that I might recount minutely the events of that wonderful life as it was unfolded to me day by day, but I can only say, I may not. When I undertook to make a record of that never-to-be-forgotten time, I did not realize how many serious difficulties I would have to encounter, how often I would have to consider if I might really reveal this truth or paint that scene as it appeared to me. The very heart has often been left out of some wonderful scene I was attempting to describe, because I found I dared not reveal its sacred secret. I realize painfully that the narrative, as I am forced to give it, falls infinitely short of what I hoped to make it when I began. But bear with me. It is no fancy sketch that I am drawing, but the veritable life beyond, as it appeared to me when the exalted spirit rose triumphant over the flesh. My brother and I walked slowly back to the margin of the lake, where we stepped into a boat laying near the shore, and were at once transported to the farther shore of the lake, standing upon a marble terrace the entrance to the city by the lake. I never knew by what power these boats were propelled. There were no oarsmen, no engine, no sails upon the one in which we crossed the water, but it moved steadily onward till we were safely transported to our destination. I was roused from my thoughts by the boat touching the marble terrace and found my brother already standing and waiting to assist me to the shore. Passing up a slight upward slope, we found ourselves in a broad street that led into the centre of the city. The streets, I found, were all very broad and smooth, and paved with marble and precious stones of every kind. Though they were thronged with people, intent on various duties, not an atom of debris, nor even dust, was visible anywhere. There seemed to be vast business houses of many kinds, though I saw nothing resembling our large mercantile establishments. There were many colleges, schools, many book and music stores and publishing houses. Several large manufactories, where I learned, were spun the fine silken threads of manifold colors which were so extensively used in the weaving of the draperies I have already mentioned. There were art rooms, picture galleries, libraries, many lecture halls, and vast auditoriums. But I saw no churches of any kind. At first this somewhat confused me, until I remembered that there are no creeds in heaven. 
but that all worship together in harmony and love, the children of one and the same loving Father. Ah, I thought, what a pity that that fact, if no other in the great economy of heaven, could not be proclaimed to the inhabitants of earth. How it would do away with the petty contentions, jealousies, and rivalries of the church militant. No creeds in heaven, no controverted points of doctrine, no charges of heresy brought by one professed Christian against another, no building up of one denomination upon the ruins or downfall of a different sect, but one great universal brotherhood whose head is Christ and whose cornerstone is love. I thought of the day we listened in the great auditorium at home to the divine address of our beloved Master, of the bowed heads and uplifted voices of that vast multitude as every voice joined in the glorious anthem, Crown Him Lord of All. And I could have wept to think of the faces that must some day be bowed in shame when they remember how often they have in mortal life said to a brother Christian, Stand aside, I am holier than thou. We found no dwelling houses anywhere in the midst of the city until we came to the suburbs. Here they stood in great magnificence and splendor. But one pleasing fact was that every home had its large yard full of trees and flowers and pleasant walks. Indeed, it was everywhere, outside of the business centre of the town, like one vast park, dotted with lovely houses. There was much that charmed, much that surprised me in this great city of which I may not fully speak, but which I can never forget. We found in one place a very large park, with walks, drives, fountains, miniature lakes, and shaded seats, but no dwellings or buildings of any kind except an immense circular open temple capable of seating many hundred, and where, my brother told me, a seraph choir assembled at a certain hour daily to render the oratorios written by the great musical composers of earth and heaven. It had just departed and the crowd who enjoyed its divine music yet lingered, as though loath to leave a spot so hallowed. We shall remember the hour, my brother said, and come again when we can hear them. Still passing through the park, we came out upon the open country, and walked some distance through flowery meadows and undulating plains. At length we entered a vast forest, whose trees towered above us like swaying giants. The day was well nigh spent, the day so full of surprises and happy hours. My brother walked by me, absorbed in silent thought, but with a touch beyond even his usual gentleness. I did not ask where we were going at that unusual hour, so far from home for fear and doubt and questionings no longer vex the quiet of my soul. Although the forest was dense, the golden glow of the twilight rested beneath the trees and sifted down through the quivering branches overhead, as though falling through the windows of some great cathedral. At length we emerged from the forest upon a vast plain that stretched out into limitless space before us. And far away we faintly heard the thunder of the breaking waves of that immortal sea, of which I'd heard so much but had not yet seen. Except for their faint and distant reverberation, the silence about us was intense. It was a beautiful, memorable scene which we gazed at for some time. When we turned to go, I was surprised that we did not return into the forest, but went still further out upon the plain. But when I saw that we approached the juncture of two nearby streams, I began to understand that we would return 
by way of the river instead of by forest and lake. We reached the stream at length, and stepping into a boat that lay by the shore, we were soon floating with the current toward home. We passed through much beautiful scenery on our course that I had not seen before, and which I resolved I would visit in the future, when leisure from my daily duties would permit. Lovely villas, surrounded by beautiful grounds, stretching directly up from the water's edge, lay on both sides of the river and formed a panorama upon which the eye never tired of resting. Toward the end of the journey we passed my sister's lovely home, and we could plainly see her and her husband drinking in the scene with enraptured eyes from the window of their own room. My brother and I were both silent the greater part of the time during our journey homeward though each noted with observant eyes the signs of happy domestic life by which we were surrounded on every side. The verandas and steps of the homes we passed were full of their happy inmates. Glad voices and songs could be heard constantly, and merry little shouts of laughter came from the throngs of little children playing everywhere upon the flowery lawns. Once I broke the silence by saying to my brother, I have more than once been delightfully surprised to hear the familiar songs of earth reproduced in heaven. These surprises do not come by chance, he answered. One of the delights of this rare life is that no occasion is ever overlooked for reproducing here the pure enjoyments of our mortal life. It is our Father's pleasure to make us realize that this existence is but a continuation of the former life, only without its imperfections and its cares. Frank, I believe you're the only one of four friends here who's never questioned me about the dear ones left behind. Why is it? He smiled a peculiarly happy smile as he answered, Perhaps it's because I already know more than you could tell me. I wondered if that were not so, I said for I remembered well how my dear father had said, in speaking of my brother upon the first day of my coming, he stands very near the master. And I knew how often he was sent on missions. I lay down upon my couch on our return, with a heart overflowing with joy and gratitude and love beyond the power of expression. I will reach the standard you've set before me, my Saviour, I prayed, with hands clasped and uplifted to him, if it takes all my life in heaven and all the help from your angels of light to accomplish it. With these words upon my lips, I sank into the blissful repose of heaven. So much occurred, and so rapidly from the very hour of my entrance within the beautiful gates, that it is impossible for me to transcribe it all. I have been able only to cull here and there incidents that happened day by day, and in so doing many things I would gladly have related have unconsciously been omitted. Of the many dear friends I met, only a very few have been mentioned for the reason that, of necessity, such meetings are so similar in many respects that the constant repetition in detail would become wearisome. I have aimed principally to give such incidents as would show the beautiful domestic life in that happy world, to make apparent the reverence and love all hearts feel toward our blessed Lord for every good and perfect gift and to show forth the marvellous power of the Christ's love, even in the life beyond the grave. This world, strange and new to me, held multitudes of those I loved in the years gone by, and there was scarcely an hour that did not renew for me the ties that once were severed in the mortal life. 
I remember that as I was walking one day in the neighborhood of Mrs. Wickham's home, shortly after my first memorable visit there, I was attracted by an unpretentious but very beautiful house, almost hidden by luxuriant climbing rose vines, whose flowers of creamy whiteness were beyond compare with any roses I'd yet seen in earth or heaven. Meeting Mrs. Wickham, I pointed to the house and asked, Who lives there? Suppose you go over and see, she said. Is it anyone I know? I asked. I fancy so. See, someone is even now at the door as though expecting you. I crossed over the snowy walk and flowery turf, for the house stood in an angle formed by two paths crossing almost opposite Mrs. Wickham's and before I could ascend the steps, I found myself in the embrace of two loving arms. Rebecca Springer! I was sure it was you when I saw you go to Mrs. Wickham's a day or two ago. Did not she tell you I was here? She had no opportunity until today, I said. But dear Aunt Anne, I should have found you soon, I'm sure you know that. Yes, I'm sure you would. Then I recounted to her something of my visit to Mrs. Wickham's that eventful day. She listened with her dear face full of sympathy, then said, There, dear, you need not tell me, do I not know? When the master comes to gladden my eyes, I've no thought or care for anything beyond, for days and days. Oh, the joy, the peace of knowing I'm safe in this blessed haven! How far beyond all our earthly dreams is this divine life? She sat for a moment, lost in thought, then said wistfully, Now tell me of my children. Are they coming? I gladdened her heart with all the cheering news I could bring of her loved ones. And so we talked the hours away, recalling many sweet memories of the earth life, of friends and home, and family ties, and looking forward to the future coming to us of those whom even the joys of heaven could not banish from our hearts. Then also another evening, as the soft twilight fell, and many of our dear home circle were gathered with us in the great flower room, we heard a step on the veranda, and as my brother went to open the door, a gentle voice said, is Mrs. Springer really here? She is really here. Come and see for yourself. And sweet Mary Green entered the room. I am so glad to welcome you home, she said, coming to me with extended hands and looking into mine with her tender, earnest eyes. My precious girl, I cried, taking her to my heart in a warm embrace. I've been asking about you and longing to see you. I could scarcely wait to reach here when I heard that you had come. Now tell me everything, everything, she said, as I drew her to a seat close beside me. But the questions asked and the answers given are too sacred for rehearsal here. Every individual member of her dear home circle was discussed, and many were the incidents she recounted to me that had occurred in her presence when her mother and I were together and talking of the dear child we considered far removed from our presence. I was often so close I could have touched you with my hand had the needed power been given, she said. After a long, close conversation had been held between us, I took her to the library, whither the rest had gone to examine a new book just that day received. I introduced her to them all as the daughter of dear friends still on earth, confident of the welcome she would receive. My younger sister and she at once became interested in each other, finding congeniality in many of their daily pursuits, and I was glad to believe they would henceforth see much of each other in many different ways. There was no measurement of time as we measure it here, although many still spoke in the old-time language of months and days and years. I have no way of describing it as it seemed to me then. 
There were periods and allotted times. There were hours for happy duties, hours for joyful pleasures, and hours for holy praise. I only know it was all harmony, all joy, all peace at all times and in all conditions. The current of my life flowed on in the heavenly ways until the months began to lengthen into years. My daily studies ascended higher in the scale of celestial mysteries. I never wearied of study, though much was taught and gained through the medium of observation in the journeys that I was permitted to take with my brother into different parts of the heavenly kingdom. I never lacked time for social pleasures and enjoyments, for there's no clashing of duties with inclinations, no unfilled desires, no vain striving for the unattainable in that life as in the life of earth. Many precious hours of intercourse were spent in my dear father's home, and sometimes on rare occasions I was permitted to accompany him to his field of labor and assist him in instructing those lately come into the new life with little or no preparation for its duties and responsibilities. On one occasion, my father said to me, I have the most difficult problem with which to deal that I have ever yet met in this work. It's how to enlighten and help a man who suddenly plunged from an apparently honorable life into the very depths of crime. I have never been able to get him to come with me to the river where those earthly cobwebs would be swept away from his poor brain, his excuse always being that God's mercy is so great in allowing him inside heaven's gates at all that he's content to remain always at the lowest scale of enjoyment and life. No argument or teaching thus far can make him alter his decision. He was led away by infatuation for a strange woman and killed his aged mother in order to secure her jewels for this wretched creature. He was executed for the crime, of which in the end he sincerely repented, but he left life with all the horror of the deed clinging to his soul. Has he seen his mother since coming here? Does she know of his arrival? No, she is entirely alone in this world, and it was not thought wise to tell her of his coming until his soul was in better condition to receive her. He was an only child and does not lack the elements of refinement, but he was completely under the control of this vile, though fascinating woman. It is said that she drugged his wine and incited him to do the dreadful deed while under its influence, because of her hatred for his mother, whose influence was against her. When he came from under the influence of the wine, he was horrified at what he'd done, and his infatuation turned to loathing, but alas, too late. He would not see her during his entire incarceration. How long was he in prison? Almost a year. Has he seen the master? No, he begs not to see him. He is very repentant and grateful to be saved from the wrath he feels was his just punishment. But though he is conscious that his sin is forgiven, he does not feel that he would ever stand in the presence of the Holy One. And here, as upon earth, each must be ready to receive him. His presence is never given undesired. I have not yet appealed for higher help. My ambition is to lead these weak souls upward through the strength entrusted to me. Can you suggest anything that might reach him? His mother. May I bring her? He thought a moment reflectively, then said, A woman's intuition. Yes, bring her. I soon was on my way. I found the poor woman, laid the facts gently before her, and awaited her decision. There was no hesitancy upon her part. In an instant she said, 
My poor boy, certainly I will go with you at once. We found my father waiting for us and went immediately to the great home where these students stayed. It was a beautiful great building in the midst of a park with shaded walks and fountains and flowers everywhere. To one just freed from earth, it seemed a paradise indeed, but to those of us who had tasted heaven's rarer joys, something was wanting. We missed the lovely mansions, the children playing on the lawns, the music of the angel choir. It was tame indeed, beside the pleasures we had tasted. We found a young man seated beneath one of the flower-laden trees, intently reading a book that my father had left with him. There was a peaceful look on his face, but it was rather the look of a patient resignation than of ardent joy. His mother approached him alone, my father and I remaining in the background. After a little time he glanced up and saw his mother standing near him. A startled look came into his face, and he arose to his feet. She extended her arms toward him and cried out pathetically, John, my dear boy, come home to me. I need you. That was all. With a low cry, he knelt at her feet and clasped her knees, sobbing, Mother, mother. She stooped and put her tender arms about him. She drew his head gently to her breast and showered kisses on his bowed head. Oh, the warm mother love, the same in earth and heaven. Only the Christ love can exceed it. Here was this outraged mother, sent into eternity by the hands of him who should have shielded and sustained her, bending above her repentant son with the mother love with which her heart was overflowing, shining upon him from her gentle eyes. I saw my father turn his head to conceal his emotion, and I knew that my own eyes were wet. My father had explained to the mother that the first thing to be accomplished was to get her son to the river. So we now heard her say caressingly, Come, John, my boy, take the first step upward for your mother's sake, that in time I may have the joy of seeing you in our own home. Come, John, with mother. She drew him gently, and to our great joy we saw him rise and go with her, and their steps led them to the river. They walked hand in hand, and as far as we could see them, she seemed to be soothing and comforting him. Thank God, said my father fervently. There'll be no further trouble now. When they return, he will see with clearer vision. And so it proved. After this, by divine permission, I became much of the time a co-laborer with my father, and thus enjoyed his society and his instruction much oftener than otherwise I would have done. Some three years, counted by the calendar of earth, after I had entered upon the joys and duties of the heavenly life, I sat resting upon my upper veranda after a somewhat arduous journey to a distant city of the heavenly realm. From this part of the veranda I could see rare glimpses of the river throughout the overhanging branches of the trees. Here my brother sought me out, and throwing himself on a soft veranda lounge nearby, lay for a time motionless and silent. He had been absent on a mission for some time, and he had not told me, as he sometimes did, where his mission had led him, and I had not asked him, feeling sure that it was best that what I should know would be imparted. My own duties of late had been unusually responsible, leading me daily into a distant part of the heavenly kingdom. At length, after a time of rest, my brother arose to a sitting posture, and regarding me for a moment in silence, said gently, I've news for you, little sister. A thrill like an electric shock passed through me, 
and in an instant I cried out joyously, He's coming! He nodded his head with a sympathetic smile, but did not at once reply. Then he said, He was stricken suddenly while in the midst of work, while apparently in perfect health, and has not regained consciousness since, nor will he ever on earth. When will it be? Am I to go to him? I asked. Frank hesitated an instant before saying, Of course you are permitted to go, if your heart will not be denied. Oh, I must go to him. I must be the first to greet him. Perhaps it may be granted him to see me, even while he's yet in the flesh. He shook his head sadly at this and said, No, dear, he'll not know you. Why? Frank, tell me all, and why you think, as I plainly see you do, that it's not best that I should go. He was stricken suddenly in the midst of his work, while apparently in perfect health, and has not regained consciousness since, nor will he ever on earth. Hence, your presence would be no solace to him. When was this? Three days ago. I have been with him almost constantly by day and night ever since. Oh, why did you not tell me sooner? It was thought wise to spare you the unnecessary pain of seeing him suffer when you could not minister to him. And I have come to tell you now that you may go if you still so desire. He will know me as soon as the struggle is past. Yes, but he will be bewildered and weak. He will need stronger help and guidance than you alone can give, and you will miss the rapture of the meeting as it would be a little later on. I said, May I go to meet him? What would you have me do? You know I yield to your wiser judgment even against the pleading of my heart. I will not say do not go, my brother replied. You shall accompany me if you wish. I think only that after the first bewilderment of the change has passed, after he is bathed in the waters of the river of life, he will be better fitted for the delightful reunion that awaits him. You remember what the waters did for you, and how bewildered and oppressed in spirit you were till you went with me that morning to the river. You were always right, my brother, and I will yield to your wise advice, although my heart cries out to hasten at once to his side. He arose and, bending over me, lightly dropped a kiss on my brow, and in a moment passed from my sight. I bowed my head upon my hand and gave myself to mingled sad and happy thoughts. Was my dearly beloved husband suffering? Oh, that morning were here! How could I wait even that brief while for the sight of his beloved face? How strange, I thought, that even in this matter, so near to my heart, I am able to yield unmurmuringly. Father, I thank thee. I thank thee for the glad reunion so near at hand, but even more than that, for the sweet submission in all things that has grown into my life, that I can yield to thy will, even when thou wouldst permit it to be otherwise. Uplifted with a new, strange delight, I recrossed the lawn, stopping upon the veranda before entering the house to gather a knot of cream-white roses and fasten them to my breast. Then going to the library, I refilled the golden bowl with spicy-breathed scarlet carnations, laying one aside to fasten upon my husband's shoulder. I wanted to myself gather the flowers that would greet him on his coming. I twisted up my hair in the manner that he had most admired and fastened a creamy bud within the folds that I might seem to him as I had of old. Suddenly a soft touch rested upon my bowed head and a voice I had learned to recognize and love beyond all things on earth or heaven said, have I not said truly, though he were dead, yet shall he live again? What are the years of separation since the meeting is now at hand? Come now, let us reason a while together, the master said, smiling down into my uplifted face. He took my extended hand into his own, 
and sitting down beside me, continued, Let us now consider what these years have done for you. Do you not feel that you are infinitely better prepared to confer happiness than when you first parted from him you love? I nodded in glad affirmation. Do you not realize that, since you stand on a higher plane, with more exalted ideas of life and its duties, and in the strength of the Father, you two hence will walk upward, higher, together. Again, I gladly agreed. Is the home life here less attractive than it was in the earth life? No, no, a thousand times no, I cried. Then there is nothing but joy in the reunion at hand. Nothing but joy i echoed then the saviour led me on to talk of the one soon to come and i opened my glad heart to him and told him of the noble life the unselfish toil the high ideals the unfaltering trust of him i loved i spoke of his fortitude in misfortune his courage in the face of sore trial and disappointment his forgiveness even of malicious injury and concluded by saying he lived the Christianity many others professed. He always outdistanced me in that. The face of the Master glowed as I spoke. As he talked with me, he led me on until my soul flew upward as a lark in the early morning. He unfolded to me the mysteries of the soul life that filled my heart with a rapture, but which I might not here reveal. At length, to my infinite surprise, I saw the rosy glow deepening across the sky and knew that morning had dawned for me in heaven. The master rose and, pointing to the radiance, said, By the time you are ready to receive them, they will be here. The smile and a touch that made a benediction, he departed. As I arose and stood, with face uplifted to the coming day, I caught in the near distance the triumphant notes of the angel's choral song. And this morning, as though in sympathy with my thought, they sang, He is risen! Hear it, ye heavens, and ye sons of earth! He has arisen, and has become the first fruits of them that slept. I lifted up my voice with joy and joined their thrilling song as they swept onward and the rhythm died away. I slowly descended the stairway and crossed the lawn whose flowers never crushed nor withered beneath our feet. I felt no haste, no unwanted excitement, no unrest, though I knew he was coming, whom my soul had awaited all these years. The Master's presence filled me with calm, and peace that nothing had the power to disturb. Soon thereafter I heard voices and steps. Yes, it is the same dear step which I had so often listened for in the old home life, the step that always brought gladness to my heart and sunshine to our home. It was his step in heaven. I flew to open the doorway and in an instant was held close in the strong arms and to the loving, throbbing heart of my dear husband. Was there anything more for me that heaven could give? My brother, with thoughtful care, passed onward to the upper rooms of the house, and for a while we were alone together, we whose lives had run so happily mingled through the long years of our mortal life. I drew him within the house, and in the vestibule again he took me in his arms and drew me to his heart. This is heaven indeed, he said. We passed into the flower room, and on its threshold he stood a moment entranced with its beauty. But when I would have related to him its history, as my brother had given it to me, he said, Not today, my dear. I have only eyes and ears for you today. All else in heaven must wait. So we sat down and talked together as in the older days. The happy hours came and went, 
The day melted into the twilight glow before we realized it was half spent. Our brother Frank had come to us about noontide, and together we'd gone over the lovely home, had stood upon the broad verandas, and had eaten of the heavenly fruit. Then we all sat together where I had spent the hours waiting in the presence of the blessed Master. I told them how much that he had said to me, and how he turned into triumphant rejoicing the hours which I had anticipated would pass in lonely waiting. The eyes of my dear husband were tear-filled, and he pressed my hand, which he still kept in his, in tender sympathy. Oh, darling, it is a blessed, blessed life, I said. I already realize the blessedness, he replied, for has it not given me back my brother and my wife, my precious wife? Early the following morning I said to my husband and our brother, We must go to Father and Mother Springers today. They have the first claim after ours, Frank. Yes, we'll go at once, they both replied. So together we all started. In the earliest days of my heavenly life I had sought out with much joy the home of my husband's parents, and was by them accorded, as in the earth life, a warm place in their hearts, and many happy hours we had spent together since. Now we were taking to them a favorite son, and I realized how his coming would bring gladness to their hearts and home. It was a joyful meeting, especially to our mother and the day was far spent before we arose to return. William, said our mother, fondly laying her hand upon his arm, yours was a happy home on earth. I used to think a perfect home. It'll be far happier here, with a loving glance at me. I'm sure of that, mother. I have my dear wife and Frank constantly with me, and you and my father and Josephine, a favorite niece, to come to here, and the joys and privileges of heaven. We turned to go, and upon the threshold met an aunt, who, in the earth life, blind and helpless, had been a favorite with us all. My dear children, she exclaimed, how good it seems to see you all again. Aunt Cynthia, my husband said fondly. Yes, Aunt Cynthia but no longer groping helpless in the darkness. Whereas I once was blind, now I see, she quoted, smiling happily. And so it was. The master's touch had rested on the sightless eyes, and closing to the darkness of earth, they had opened upon the glories of heaven. Marvellous transition! No wonder we left her singing, Glory to him who this marvel has wrought, filling my spirit with joy and delight. Lo, in my blindness I safely have walked out of the darkness into the light. The days lengthened into weeks the weeks into months, and those in turn crept into years. The duties and joys of heaven grew clearer with each passing hour. Our home life was perfect, though we looked forward with joy to the future coming of our son and his wife to make our ties complete. We had often spoken of going together to the great celestial sea, but the time never seemed quite ripe for doing so. But one evening I said to my brother, I have a strange desire to go out to the sea, if you think it is wise that we should do so. I am glad that it is your desire to go, as it is mine to have you. I was about to propose this blessed journey. I will not go at this time, as it's best that you two should go alone. So in the quivering light of the glorious morning we started, full of a holy joy that Together we might make this special journey. We entered and passed through the great forest, where the golden light fell through the branches and birds of 
gorgeous plumage and song were darting everywhere. As we drew near the sea, we could hear the regular dashing of waves against the shore. Now there came bursts of triumphant song and harmony of many instruments of music. At length we emerged from the forest and stood mute and motionless before the overwhelming glory of the scene before us. From our very feet, sloped downward and toward the shore, a golden strand, many hundreds of yards wide, and extending out beyond the limits of our vision. And the sea! It spread out before us in a radiance that passes description in any language that I've ever known. The shining glory we caught in the roll of the waves, the blue tint of the waters of that sea which has no limits to its depths nor bounds. Upon its shining bosom, we saw in every direction boats, representing all nations, filled with people looking with eager faces toward the shore, many in their eagerness standing erect and gazing with wistful, expectant eyes into the faces of those upon the shore. Oh, the people upon the shore! A great mass of beautiful souls clad in the spotless garments of the redeemed. Many among them had golden harps and various instruments of music. Whenever a boat touched the shore and its inmates were welcomed by the glad voices and tender embraces of their loved ones in the throng, the harps would be held aloft and all the golden instruments would sound. Then the vast multitude would break forth into the triumphant song of victory over death and the grave. Do these people stand here always, I wonder? I asked softly. Not the same people, said a radiant being near us who had heard my question. But there is always a throng of people here, those who are expecting friends from the other life, and those who assemble here to share their joy. Some of the heavenly choristers are also continually here, but not always the same ones. You will notice that most of those who arrive are led quietly away by their friends, and many others are constantly joining the multitude. He passed onward to the shore and left us wrapped in wonder. We soon became interested in watching the reunions and found ourselves joining with rapture in the glad songs of rejoicing. Now and then, a face we remembered seeing on earth would be among the eager faces in the boats, but none that had been especially dear to us. Still, it made us notice more closely and sympathize more heartily with those who welcomed beloved friends. Now we would see a wife, caught in the close embrace of a waiting husband. Now a little child with a glad cry would spring into the outstretched arms of the happy mother. Friend would clasp friend in glad reunion, and here an aged mother would be folded to the heart of a beloved child. As one more boat of strength and beauty came riding gracefully over the waves, we observed the tall figure of a man standing near the prow with his arms about a graceful woman who stood by his side. Each shaded with uplifted hand the splendor from their dazzled eyes, and scanned, wistfully and searchingly, the faces of the crowd as the boat neared the shore. Suddenly, with a great thrill of joy surging through my being, I cried out, It is our precious son and his dear wife! and they've come together. In an instant we were swiftly moving through the throng that had parted in ready sympathy to let us pass. And as the boat touched the shore, with a swift movement they were both beside us, the dear daughter already closely clasped to the hearts of her own happy parents who were waiting near the water's edge, while at the same instant we felt the arms of our beloved son enfolding us. Soon thereafter, we were all in each other's embrace. Oh, what a rapturous moment was that! Our home life in heaven complete, 
no partings again, forever. As we stood with encircling arms, scarcely realizing the unexpected bliss, the heavenly choir broke into song, and with uplifted faces radiant with joy, eyes filled with happy tears, and voices trembling with emotion, we all joined in the glad anthem. The song arose and fell triumphantly as the vast multitude caught it up, and the surge of the waves made a deep undertone to the melody that increased its solemnity, as with bowed heads and full hearts we passed onward hand in hand, and the light that fell about us was purer, holier, more divine than it had ever been before. The time came one day, as I was in my lovely room that had really become to me a shrine, that I turned and lay down for an instant's rest. But strange thoughts and fancies crept into my brain, such as I had not known for years. I felt confused and bewildered, and started up restlessly from my pillow, only to fall back again in doubt, and something akin to dread. What could it mean? Could the old unrest of earth find place in this divine retreat? Then I heard unfamiliar voices. Someone said, Her color is better than it has been for several days, I think. Yes, there's no doubt that she is better today. There is really hope for her now, I'm sure. But she came very near passing through the gates. Very near passing? passing through the gates, as though I had not passed through, and in returning left them so ajar that gleams of the heavenly radiance from beyond them will fall about my life forever. received since the publication of Intramuros, repeated inquiries have been made of me on different points contained in the book, requiring much correspondence, and it has been suggested that possibly the addition of a few pages as a supplement to the book might explain some matters, or possibly make more clear some points that have not been fully comprehended by the reader. Let me in the beginning reassert what I have heretofore stated, that I have never claimed that this strange experience is either a revelation or an inspiration. It came to me during a period of great physical suffering and prostration, and I have always considered it as sent in compensation for that suffering. Be this as it may, it has been a great comfort and help to me, and through letters received from others I am led to believe it has been the same to many who have read it, for which cause I am extremely gratified. I wish that I might give the entire experience just as it came to me, but I find that earth language is wholly inadequate for me to do so. There were so many mysteries, so many teachings, far beyond anything that in this life we have known, that I find myself bewildered and lost when I attempt to convey to others the marvellous things that at that time seemed indeed to me to be a most wonderful revelation. The question has repeatedly been asked me, was this a real experience or merely a fanciful sketch? What I have written above 
will as nearly answer that question as it is possible for me to do so. Anything that I might add on that point would simply be superfluous. To me, at the time, it was as real as any experience in this life could possibly be. Questions have been asked respecting the comparative distances in heaven and our powers of passing from one point to another. And the question has even been asked if in the other life we develop wings that aided us in passage as the wings of a bird. These matter-of-fact questions are sometimes quite difficult to answer. For my belief is that if I were really in the other life, as during this experience I seem to be, my thoughts would be so far above, so lifted beyond such temporal matters, that I would be unable to answer such inquiries satisfactorily on my return to this life. Looking back upon it now, and trying to gather facts from the impressions that I then received, I would say that none who have ever passed through mortal life would in any way be changed from their present personal appearance, except to be etherealized and glorified. When, at the close of that wonderful day, when I'd first met the Saviour, we heard the angel voices as we stood together in the great flower room, and looking upward saw the child faces in the golden twilight above us. They had delicate, shadowy wings, half concealing the baby forms. Except for this, I have no recollection of having seen any of those glorious wings of which we so often read. To me it seems that to the angels of God, who have always lived in heaven, these are given. But to those who have suffered and toiled and borne the cross below, is given only the glorified form such as our Saviour himself bore. We appear to our friends when we meet them over there, just as they saw us here, only purified and perfect. Still, we had powers of locomotion given to us that carried us from point to point swiftly and securely as though borne by a boat upon the waters. I do not know how I can better illustrate this point than by giving a little incident not mentioned in the book. I remember, as I sat one morning upon the upper terrace in the house of my sister, whom I had welcomed there soon after my arrival, and who, though really then a denizen of earth, has passed over and taken possession of that beautiful home prepared for her, that my sister said to me, I often look across the river to those lovely hills in the distance, and wonder if it is all as beautiful there as here. I mean some day to go and see. Why not go today? was my answer. Could you go with me this morning? was her inquiry, as she turned her radiant face again toward the river and the lovely fields beyond. With pleasure, I replied. I've often wished to go myself. There's something very inviting in the beautiful landscape beyond the river. Where is Oliver? I asked. Will he not accompany us? No, she said, looking smilingly toward me. He's gone on an important mission for the master today. But you and I, dear, can go, and be at home again before his return. Then let us do so, I replied, rising and giving her my hand. She at once arose, and instead of turning toward the stairway in the center of the building, we turned and walked deliberately to the low coping that surrounded the upper veranda. Without a moment's hesitation, we stepped over this into the sweet air that lay about us. There was no more fear of falling than if our feet had been upon the solid earth. We had the power of passing through the air at will and through the water, just as we had the power of walking upon the crystal paths and greens about us. We ascended slightly until we were just above the treetops, and then, what shall I say? We did not fly. We made no effort either with our hands or our feet. I can only think of the word drifting that will at all describe this wonderful experience. We went as a leaf or a feather floats through the air on a balmy day, and the sensation most delightful. We saw beneath us through the green branches of the trees 
the little children playing, and the people walking, some for pleasure, some for duty. As we neared the river, we looked down on the pleasure boats upon the water, and upon the people sitting or lying or walking on the pebbly bottom, and we saw them with the same distinctness as though we were looking at them simply through the atmosphere. Conversing as we drifted onward, we soon were over the tops of the hills to which we had looked so longingly from the veranda of my sister's house, and for some time we had no words to exchange. Our hearts were filled with sensations such as only the scenes of heaven can give. As we passed onward, in looking down, we began to see many suburban villages, similar to that in which our own happy homes were situated. Among many of them there was an unfamiliar air, and the architecture of the buildings in many respects seemed quite different from our own. I suggested to my sister that we drop downward a little. On doing so, we soon realized what caused this apparent difference in the architecture and surroundings. Where our homes were situated, we were surrounded by people we had known and loved on earth and of our own nationality. Many of these villages over which we were now passing we found were formed from what to us would be termed of foreign nations, and each village retained some of the peculiarities of its earth life, and these to us were naturally unfamiliar. We recognized again the wisdom and goodness of the Father in thus allowing friends of the same nationality to be located near each other in heaven as on earth. As we still drifted onward, in passing over an exquisitely beautiful valley between low hills of the most enchanting verdure, we saw a group of people seated upon the ground in a semicircle. They seemed to be hundreds in number, and in their midst a man was standing who apparently was talking to them. Something familiar and yet unfamiliar in the scene attracted us, and I said, let us go nearer and hear, if possible, what he's saying, and see who these people are. Upon doing this, we found the people to resemble in great measure our own Indian tribes, their dress in a manner corresponding to that worn upon earth, though so etherealized as to be surpassingly beautiful. But the dusky faces and the long black hair still remained. The faces with intense interest depicted on each were turned toward the man who we could see was talking to them. Looking upon him, in a whisper of surprise, I said to my sister, Why, he's a missionary. As so often seemed to me to happen in that experience, when a surprise or a difficulty presented itself, there was always someone near to answer and enlighten us. And so we found on this occasion that our instructor was beside us, ready to answer any surprise or question that might be asked. He said at once, Yes, you're right. This is a missionary who gave his life to what on earth would be called the heathen. He spent many years in working for them and enlightening those who sat in darkness with the result, as you can see before you, of bringing hundreds into the kingdom of the Master. But as you will naturally suppose, they have much to learn, and here he still gathers them about him, and day by day leads them higher and higher into the blessed life. Are there many such, I asked, doing this work in this beautiful realm? Many hundreds, he said. To these folks, unenlightened as they were when they first came, heaven is as beautiful and happy a place as it is to any who've ascended higher, simply because we can enjoy only in the capacity to which our souls can reach. There are none of us who have not much yet to learn of this wonderful country. In several instances, as we drifted across the villages, we heard songs of praise arising from the temples and from people collected in different ways. In many cases, to our surprise, the hymns and the words were those with which we had been familiar on earth, and, although sung in a strange tongue, we understood them all. 
That was another of the wonderful surprises of heaven. There was no language there that we could not understand. On and on and on, through wonderful scenes of beauty we passed, returning finally to our own homes by a different way from that which we had gone forth, seeming to have made almost a circle in our pleasant journeyings. When I left my sister in her own home, she whispered to me as she bade me goodbye for the present. It has been a day of such wonderful rest and pleasure. We must soon repeat it together. And I answered, Yes, dear, we will. In several instances, the subject of dual marriages has been introduced. More than once it has been suggested, if a man marrying in early life and being devotedly attached to the woman he is married should unfortunately lose her, and after many years of solitary waiting find another congenial soul to whom his whole heart goes out and marriage is the result, and they have many years of wedded happiness together before she too is called, to whom will he belong in the other life? Speaking from my own natural intuitions, I cannot but think that as soon as the immortal part of us leaves the earthly tenement, it lays down forever with that tenement all thoughts that embarrassed or grieved or pained the spirit. In the homes of heaven there was perpetual love and joy and peace and happiness without measure. This one thing I know, in heaven there are no conflicting ties, no questions that vex, no conditions that annoy. The whole heart springs up to do the will of the Father, and nothing less than that will suffice. In answer to the question in many instances proposed to me as to whether I consider this experience as a revelation, I can only say as heretofore, that I gave it as it came to me, and everyone must draw his own inference concerning it. I can be the guide to no one. There are some seeming inconsistencies in the book of which I myself am aware. Looking back upon it after nearly four years have passed, it seems to me to be more a series of instructions such as we give little children here in a kindergarten. It does not purport to be a revelation of what has been or what will be in the strict sense of the word, but as I have already suggested, more as we would teach children in a kindergarten. I myself noticed in transcribing this strange experience the fact that the first lesson to be taught almost invariably came as an illustration, and after my wonder and pleasure had taken in all that the picture itself would teach, then followed the revelation or a general application of its meaning. For instance, that I may make my meaning more clear, when I myself first entered within the gates, I was shown the wonders of the celestial gardens and the magic of the beautiful river, then the meeting with the dear ones from whom I had been so long parted, and so I came to know the rapture of the disembodied spirit on its first entrance within the gates. Afterwards followed the instruction or first lessons concerning this life into which I seem to have entered, until, as I said, the first illustrations and instructions formed for me but one perfect lesson. And when, as time passed, I met and welcomed my dear sister, my husband, and my son, I knew the other side of the question, the joy that came even to the angels in heaven when they welcome the beloved ones who came to them from the world below. Again, the question is many times repeated, does this experience retain its vividness as time passes, or does it grow unreal and dreamlike to you? I can partially forget some of the happiest experiences of my earth life, but time seems only to intensify to me the wonders of those days when my feet really stood upon the borderland of the two worlds. It seemed to me that at every step we took in the divine life our souls reached up towards something better, and we had no inclination to look behind to that which had passed. Like the cup 
that is filled to overflowing at the fountain with pure and sparkling water, so our souls were filled, more than filled, with draughts from the fountain of all good, until there was no longer room for aught else. How then, you ask, could you reach out for more when you had all that you could receive? Because moment by moment, hour by hour, our souls grew and expanded and opened to receive fresh draughts of divine instruction which was constantly lifting us nearer to the source of all perfection. Some of the letters that have come to me have been so pathetic in their inquiries that they've called forth sympathetic tears, an intense longing to speak with authority upon the questions raised. That privilege God has not given me. I can only tell how it seemed to me in those blissful hours when earth seemed remote and heaven very near and real. One suffering mother writes, Do you think I could pray still for my darling girl? How I long to take her in sympathetic arms and whisper to her that the dear child of her love I doubted not was praising God continually and had no longer need of earthly prayer. She loved and trusted the Saviour as she went down into the valley of shadows, and his loving arms received and comforted her. To all such I would say, and many are the letters of like import received, look up, dear friends, and see the loved ones as I saw those so dear to me, happy and blessed beyond all human conception in the house of many mansions, prepared for us by our loving Father. Oh, those wonderful mansions upon which my longing heart looks back! Believe in them, look forward to them, beloved friends, for we have the Saviour's promise that they are there. In my Father's house are many mansions. His promises never fail. And I am sure of one thing, they will not be less beautiful than those I looked upon in my vision. This thought, to me, answers in a measure the questions asked in regard to dual marriages. My own belief of this mortal life is that no two friends can occupy the same place in our hearts. Each heart is filled with chambers, stately and old, and to each beloved guest is assigned a chamber exclusively for himself. That room is always his. If death or distance or even disgrace separates him from us, still the room is his and his only forever. No other person can ever occupy it. Others may have rooms equally choice, but when a guest has once departed from the room he's held in another heart, the door of that room is barred forever. It is held in violet, sacred to the departed guest. And so in heaven, each guest has his separate room or home. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place, room, for you. What are the duties of heaven? So many and varied, I should judge, as to make the question unanswerable. Much in intramuros shows the trend of daily life. Rest? One of the duties as well as the pleasures of heaven. Rest does not of necessity mean inactivity. How often in this life does laying aside of one duty and taking up another bring rest to both mind and body? Still, as I found it, there was at times absolute rest for both mind and body in that blissful repose that only heaven can give. In conclusion, I can only reiterate that I am no prophet, I am no seer, but in my inmost soul I honestly believe that if the joys of heaven are greater, if the glories within the gates are more radiant than I in my vision beheld them, I cannot understand how even the immortal spirit can bear.
bear to look upon them. <laughs>